Jonathan Jarvis. Congressman Raul Grijalva of Arizona chairs the National Resources Subcommittee on National Parks. This is just over three hours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me call the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands to order. Uh, the uh, hearing today is Building on America's Best Idea, the Next Century of the National Park System. I want to thank all the uh, all the panelists that we're going to have with us today uh, and uh, thank all of you for your attendance and my colleagues for uh, their attendance to what I believe is uh, the first uh, hearing and beginning to shape what our response is going to be as Congress along with uh, the national park system uh, to the upcoming centennial which is a great achievement for the nation and also, I believe, a great opportunity to deal with some of the challenges that our park system is uh, facing and will face in the future. Uh, before I uh, go into the statement, let me welcome to uh, the subcommittee a new member and also uh, a member of the full committee as well, uh, Mr. Lujan from the 3rd District of New Mexico, the Land of Enchantment. Sir, welcome and good to have you with us. Uh, on August 25th, 1916, President Woodrow Wilson signed into law the National Park Service Act, known today as the MPS Organic Act. The act directed the newly created agency to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife in the parks and to provide the, for the enjoyment of the same in such a manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. In just six years, we will celebrate the centennial of the signing of this act and this 100th anniversary is an important opportunity to review the agency's past and explore the possibilities for the future. The challenges posed by managing a system which includes a burial site for African slaves in Manhattan, a Cold, a Cold War missile silo in South Dakota, the trails that brought European settlers to the frontiers, and other sites from America Samoa to Alaska are significant and continue to grow. Our hearing today brings together a distinguished group of witnesses who will share with us their ideas regarding what lies ahead for our natural, national parks. The last hundred years have set a course and built a tremendous foundation. But as we move into the second century, we are moving into a different world and our national parks and the National Park Service will be tested as never before. We are grateful to our witnesses for their time and effort to be here today. In particular, I'm pleased to welcome National Park Service Director John Jarvis to our hearing for his first visit before the subcommittee. Director Jarvis, year of service, years of service to the national parks as a ranger, superintendent, and regional director are well known and greatly appreciated. And for those who do not know, Director Jarvis has been serving as the Interior Department's incident commander down, down in the Gulf for the last three weeks, helping to coordinate the government's response to the oil spill. Director Jarvis, uh, we realize how difficult it, has, it was for you to get away uh, from those duties, and we very much appreciate your presence here today and the time that you've afforded us. The stewardship of, the, of, the, of this world-class national park system handed to us by truly visionary pioneers is a daunting task. We welcome our witnesses today to help us rise to that occasion and to meet that challenge. Uh, let me at this point uh, welcome all of you and uh, Mr. Jarvis, the, uh, the time is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for this opportunity to appear before the subcommittee to discuss uh, the second century of the national park system. If I may, I would like to submit my full written testimony for the record and just summarize uh, in the time I have allotted. On August 25, 1916, President Wilson signed into law the National Park Service Organic Act, which gave our national parks a fundamental statement of purpose and created a body of dedicated professionals to care for them. Since then, the national park system has grown from an initial 36 parks, monuments, and reservations to 392 units. From a handful of park wardens, our workforce has grown to 22,000. Our annual visitation has grown from 350,000 to 285 million. So it is fitting that we consider the National Park Service for the next century. 
Our core responsibilities will remain the stewardship and care of our national parks, service to our visitors, and attention to our community programs. And I believe the National Park Service can become a more adaptive and innovative organization to better respond to the challenges of the second century. As director, my priorities are, one, to provide our employees with the resources they need to do their jobs, to assure continued relevancy of our parks by connecting all Americans to them, rededicate the service to the stewardship of our natural and cultural resources, and use education to help people understand and appreciate the complexities of the natural world and our history. My priorities dovetail very well with the recommendations of the National Parks Second Century Commission, led by former Senators Howard Baker and Bennett Johnston. Over the course of 2008 and 2009, the Commission gave serious consideration to what the National Park Service needs to do and came up with four broad recommendations. One, to advance a 21st century national park idea. Two, strengthen stewardship of our nation's resources and broaden citizen service. Three, build an effective, responsive, and accountable 21st century park service. And four, ensure permanent, sustainable funding for the work of the service. I would like to just touch on a few of those recommendations under these broad categories. One suggestion of the Commission is for Congress to require the National Park System to develop a National Park System plan which would identify natural and historic themes of the United States from which additions to the system are needed. It would also identify those places where the service can best play the role of partner, assisting the efforts of others. The plan would provide a strategic approach to building a cohesive, connected, and relevant system for the next century. The Commission also recommends the service reduce the number of more than two dozen different park titles currently used for units of the National Park System. We feel strongly that a nomenclature with fewer titles would go a great way to making the public more aware of the National Park System as a whole. The Commission calls upon the NPS to invite all Americans to build connections with parks and a place of high priority on engaging diverse audiences. This ties directly to one of my four priorities, making sure that the parks remain relevant. Our nation is undergoing tremendous demographic change, and if the parks are to remain important to our changing populace, we must include new areas that tell the missing pieces of our American story. We must ensure that our interpretive and education programs are relevant, insightful, and of the highest quality so that we attract diverse audiences and can provide them with meaningful experiences. We also should hire employees who reflect our country's demographics. The National Park Service supports locally driven efforts to protect large landscapes and preserve our nation's stories by means of national heritage programs. There are, 20, there are 49 such areas in 39 states, but there is no clearly defined program. We support the recommendation of creating a system of national heritage areas. The Commission's report emphasizes the centrality of education to the National Park Service's mission, and we agree completely. Parks have a critical role to play in helping people understand and appreciate the complexities of the natural world and the historic events that have shaped our lives. Starting in the 1960s, Congress gave the National Park Service responsibility for a number of community assistance programs, and the Commission recommends that the Service make full use of them, and we agree. We will continue to assist communities in conserving rivers, preserving open space, and developing trails and greenways, and working in partnership with state and local governments in the acquisition and development of public outdoor recreation areas. We will continue to support historic preservation efforts throughout the country. The Commission calls on Congress to reauthorize the National Park System Advisory Board, <clears throat> which has responsibility for national historic landmarks, national natural landmarks, and national historic trails. A longer extension of that board would help action in pending landmark and trail proposals. The Commission calls for substantial new efforts to support leadership development, and we agree the National Park System must create a workplace that continues to attract the best and the brightest. We are discussing with the National Park Service how to accomplish another Commission's recommendations, creating a center for innovation where lessons can be shared quickly throughout the organization. This center is not actually a physical place, but we hope it will generate creative thinking at all levels in the NPS. And finally, the Commission's report states there is a need for international engagement by the Park Service that has never been more urgent. 
We will continue to be called upon to work with foreign governments, other federal agencies, and other public educational and nonprofit entities to promote the development, management, and protection of national parks and other protected areas around the world. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Mr. Director, before, before we get on the clock, let me uh, and get into the question and answer uh, session. Uh, if, you, uh, if you could please give uh, the committee an update on, on the situation in the Gulf, uh, having the responsibility that you have at this point. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be glad to. Um, as you mentioned, I have been serving uh, for the last uh, three weeks uh, as an incident commander um, for the Department of Interior, uh, stationed in Mobile, Alabama, uh, which is the Mobile sector um, of the Gulf response. Uh, my uh, responsibilities are, are to serve with the U.S. Coast Guard, uh, BP, EPA, and the state representatives for appropriate shoreli shoreline response and preparedness uh, for the uh, Gulf oil spill. Um, my area of responsibility stretch from uh, uh, the states of Mississippi, Alabama, and uh, the panhandle of Florida, but I work in coordination with our other DOI representatives down there. Um, let me just say that the Department of Interior, the National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, in prin principally have been instrumental in preparing uh, for uh, this um, unprecedented oil spill in the Gulf. One of our primary responsibilities is to get out in front of the oil spill and document the current conditions of wildlife, of wetlands, of seagrass, um, of uh, water quality and others so that we can understand uh, what the impacts will be uh, when uh, the oil makes shore. And um, we are deeply concerned, of course, about those impacts and it is essential that we get the, um, precondition assessments completed uh, along the entire Gulf Coast. This is an unprecedented oil spill in that most of our incident responses were designed to deal with um, uh, essentially a tanker running aground, sort of a point and upon which and a defined amount of oil. Um, none of our systems were designed to deal with uh, the response that is continuous in which a, a, an oil is con con continually pumped into the environment. And, um, um, and so uh, particularly over a scale uh, as large as the Gulf of Mexico. And so we are um, reinventing the incident command system as we speak by uh, uh, engaging these multiple sectors in deploying um, boom, in deploying vessels of opportunity to uh, assist in boom deployment and collecting uh, information. Um, as you, I'm sure, know, uh, all efforts at this point from the engineering standpoint are on the top kill, um, which is uh, we are all hoping will um, suspend the flow uh, to the Gulf. And, um, and then we will essentially have a defined end to this, at least in terms of the oil cleanup. At this point, we do not have a defined end. Um, and we are, we are monitoring this extensively. Let me say also the Department of Interior has been a significant contributor in the fields of science to better understand what this oil is doing, both on the surface and subsurface, uh, how it is breaking up subsurface, how the dispersants may be playing also uh, in the environment and um, the long-term effects both ecologically and economically and socially in the Gulf. Thank you very much and uh, let me extend the uh, thanks to the subcommittee for uh, the work that the National Park Service and yourself are doing in that very uh, troublesome, to say the least, crisis that that's being confronted. Thank you for that. Uh, part of the recommendations, uh, Mr. Director, have to do with, uh, with education. And, and it's our understanding that you're planning to appoint a permanent uh, senior MPS manager to oversee educational initiatives. And, and uh, Maybe if you could elaborate a little bit on that plan, as well as the fact that there is some consensus that we're not on the cutting edge technologically in order to be able to uh, implement initiatives and uh, 
and outreach programs that are going to be vital to uh, to the education component. Could you speak to both those points? If um, yes, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd be glad to. Um, I have created uh, the first Associate Director for Education and Interpretation. It's a senior executive position um, in Washington that will lead uh, the National Park Service in um, the field of education and interpretation. For many years, uh, essentially from uh, uh, Stephen Mather's time, we have had uh, field naturalists, interpreters as we call them, um, that uh, provide um, great program for the public and help explain the natural history and the cultural history of these extraordinary places that are in our, in our stewardship. Um, and over time, educational institutions uh, such as the public schools have, have learned that these are great opportunities to, I mean, where better to learn about American history than to go to those places like Gettysburg um, uh, or the Statue of Liberty or any of these places when you're talking about the, the experiences of, of all Americans. And, um, but we've never really formalized that relationship. We've helped build curriculum. We do field trips. Um, we are beginning to use technology in ways that we've never done before to bring uh, kids from the classroom without necessarily physically transporting them and connecting them uh, to our interpreters. Um, what we need is high standards. We need evaluation, just like any education institution, to ensure that uh, we are meeting uh, education objectives, uh, that we are closely linked with testing and standards uh, throughout the education institution. So, uh, having a senior position in the National Park Service that can work uh, with the Department of Education, with schools, uh, to ensure that these, uh, these institutions come together, um, I think is essential. The use of technology um, to, um, to bring kids into the classroom, uh, I mean, bring our, our interpreters into the classroom is essential to this. Um, there are, you know, millions of kids out there um, using the internet uh, to access Park Service information. Uh, but we believe that there's opportunities to even go beyond that. Um, we do a program called the Electronic Field Trip, uh, which can reach up to three million kids. Uh, from the uh, from our parks um, to um, to really get them engaged at, at a deeper level. Um, there are some challenges with technology, um, with um, IT information technology security, um, ensuring that um, that this sort of open framework that you have in the network, having the internet, really doesn't work in government very well. Um, so we need partnerships uh, with education institutions, with nonprofits in order to make those kinds of linkages with, uh, with technology to, uh, to reach kids. Thank you. Um, what, are the, what are the important tools that you feel uh, are needed to increase diversity in, uh, in MPS, both in the employee base and in the, in the constituency visitor base? Mr. Chairman, I think we have a lot of existing tools within the national park system um, to reach um, diverse audiences. We just have never thought of them in terms of a strategic deployment. For instance, um, our community assistance programs, um, the Rivers and Trails Conservation Assistance Program, the tax credit programs that we have for historic preservation um, are, are incredibly uh, wonderful programs that help within communities to preserve their own uh, history as well as their own riverfronts and long distance trails. Um, but we've never thought about it from a strategic deployment standpoint. Same thing with the state side of the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which helps um, create and protect uh, urban parklands. Um, and urban parks are a threshold experience for uh, so many families that may not have the transportation or the economic status to get out and see the big classic national parks. So um, these uh, urban parks are uh, essential. And we've proven this over and over again at places like Golden Gate, um, Santa Monica Mountains, Lowell, um, where um, we can engage uh, individuals at the local level and perhaps attract and in inspire them to explore the National Park Service uh, and the National Park System at a, at a broader level. Thank you very much. And uh, if 
there's time uh, for a second go. There'll be additional questions. If not, uh, Mr. Director, I'll submit those in writing to you for response. Let me now turn to um, a ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Hastings, for any comments, questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and once again, thanks for the concerti, uh, your uh, your uh, courtesy of allowing me to be here. And, and Director Jarvis, I just want to be very, very parochial uh, in in my uh, remarks to you in question. The uh, uh, and, and specifically, I want to talk the B about the B reactor at Hanford, which is part of the Manhattan Project National Park Service unit. Now, there is some concerns I know that Interior had with this as far as governing because it's on the, uh, on the Department of Energy land. Uh, I recognize that, but uh, Under Secretary for EM, Environmental Management in DOE, sent you a letter on May 13th uh, and encouraged you to, to work with her. Inez Tria is her name. Uh, the B reactor is a very, uh, you know, unique piece of equipment if you want to put it that way because it helped us win the Second World War and the Cold War. And uh, they have had tours now the last several years there and these tours are sold out literally uh, within hours uh, because going on the Hanford Reservation is uh, they have some security issues. So I just, I, I'm just simply saying I want you to encourage you to work with uh, Secretary Atria on this issue because there are legitimate concerns. I don't think they're insurmountable. Uh, but the interest in the B reactor specifically is extremely high, not only in my area, uh, but in other parts uh, of, of the country. So I just want to encourage you to, uh, to work with her on that. I will do that. I'll follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And, and uh, let me uh, ask uh, Dr. Christensen for any questions or comments that she may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Director. Good morning. And welcome. Um, as you may know, St. Croix, my district, looks forward to becoming a part of the national heritage system that you envision um, having in the, in the parks. Um, would the, if that system is not in place, um, would that preclude any new sites from being designated as national heritage areas? because we anticipate uh, introducing legislation for that probably next year. Um, no, actually it would uh, provide a, a very logical process for new, new uh, additions to the Heritage Area Program uh, to come into the system. But if the system is not in place and there's legislation pending, you'll, someone from the Park Service will have to come and testify in favor or against uh, the, the designation, and if the system is not in place, that would not necessarily preclude new new national heritage areas. No, it, it, the current system. Uh, well, there, there really is no system right now, but there's right. basically new heritage areas come up through Congress and are, are proposed and and created. Um, what our concern has been is that um, that they are sustainable um, and that there is appropriate uh, infrastructure in the pl in place. Uh, and governance at the local level, that they will actually be successful. And that's all we were looking for, is to create that system. Okay. I wanted to um, ask some questions also about diversifying the, um, not only the workforce, but also the visitation. Um, has there ever been any outreach to um, historically black colleges and universities or other minority serving institutions? either to bring employees in or uh, specifically maybe to reach out to those institutions for the, that uh, conservation core of students, I don't remember the exact name of it, that work in the parks during the summers? Uh, yes, there has. We've actually had a partnership uh, with uh, Historic uh, American Black Colleges um, and um, uh, the Hispanic Colleges as well uh, for some time. And um, I, I, honestly, I think it's been with mixed success. Um, and we are reevaluating that and to see how we can boost that program up um, to, and to really attract um, young people to careers in, in this organization. And there was a hearing on a bill, H.R. 1612, the Public Land Service Corps, which, um, of course, seeks to help 
uh, restore and, and preserve the parks while employing youth and promoting a culture of service. Do you think that an initiative like this could be helpful in helping to diversify the NPS workforce? I think public land service corps are an essential component to um, connecting young people to the out of doors. Um, I am not familiar with the specific language in that. I don't think I was here for that testimony. Mm -hmm. I think it was in the Gulf. But the concept. But the con conceptually, absolutely. Uh, and on the community assistance, um, which is stressed throughout the next panel, um, there is a gateway community, a gateway community program. Has that been working effectively? I mean, we've tried to. Um, employ some of the principles as I remember it, them in St. John where two-thirds of the island is a national park and it, while it, it's very helpful to the economy it does create some friction. Have gateway community um, efforts been successful in your eyes or do they have to be also taken a, another look at? Um, I think that the Gateways Community Program has lost some emphasis in, the, in recent years and it is an area that I'm very strongly interested in, in re-emphasizing. Um, in the audience here um, is my Deputy Director for Community Assistance and Communications, uh, Mickey Fern. Uh, Mickey has uh, worked in the urban parks uh, uh, for um, three to four decades uh, systems and he come, brings to the National Park Service that kind of gateway community uh, approach to parks. Um, so we are very interested in building our program in terms of gateway relationships. I think it's been, um, in the past, my experience has been dependent upon the superintendent's interest at the local level and how much they reach out and engage the local communities uh, in promotion, in tourism, in economics, in terms of life, uh, sustain lifestyle sustainability, all of those things. And I think that's, that's really the, what the second century Commission report in way is all about is reaching outside of the park boundaries and working with communities for mutual goals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Jarvis, for being here. I appreciate it. And I have, um, as is my want, a whole bunch of questions. So I think there's hopefully there'll be a couple of rounds to go through them. Uh, Mr. Jarvis, let me understand specifically as far as the report that you've all sent to us. Was this funded by Park Service or by MPCA or a combination? The funding came from a, uh, a private philanthropy uh, organization and it was facilitated through NPCA. Park Service did not put any money into it. Did MPCA then choose the commissioners who came up with the report or worked on the report? The individual commissioners were chosen by um, the executive director uh, of that commission uh, Lauren Frazier, who was not, uh, who was a retired NPS, and uh, in consultation with the National Park Service. You did not pick the commissioners at all, nor are you the chief funder. Who actually put pen to paper? Who wrote the report itself? The um, each of the uh, there was a, the commissioners divided up uh, individual sections, and so there were individual commissioners that. Um, that drafted um, significant components of the report. Um, and then there were consultants that were used as a part of that within each category. Um, and I think the final, the final writing, the final editing, uh, well, the final editing was done by the National Geographic Society uh, and their professional editors. Um, but the final content was predominantly written uh, by uh, Mr. Lauren Frazier. Okay, so it's not coming from your office. It, that's we'll, correct. Because we'll talk about the pros in a minute, and uh, I don't know if you could use any more keywords possible in some of the document here than, than was used here, but you've got a whole lot of them that are in there. <sighs> Mr. Jarvis, the Inspector General has recently issued two reports that are highly criticized of two different groups. One is the NLCS, I'm sorry, yes, the NLCS, and the other is the MMS for failing to maintain maintain an arm's length relationship with special interest groups. With this report, you seem to be walking right into the face of that as, as, uh, as dealing specifically with special interest groups to come up with a funding, with a report, with all sorts of recommendations that are in this. 
do you see yourself having a difficult time of aligning yourself with such a strong political ideological group as this, especially in light of the criticisms of doing that exact same activity, both with NLCS and with MMS? Um, I can't speak to NLCS or MMS, but in the case, this particular case, I don't see the National Park Service aligning themselves with the, the organization that produced the report, but more so with the recommendations. I think the recommendations uh, are the product of years of analysis of where the next century of the National Park System should go. In many ways, they're very consistent with the Centennial Report. That so we you don't think that arm's length requirement that was, that was specifically recommended for NLCS and MMS should apply in this situation? I think that's a different situation. Doesn't apply. Let me talk to you about a couple of things that are in here. You talk about uh, the report says the annual operating deficit is $750 million. Do you agree with that assessment or do you support the administration's current budget requests? I support the, the administration's current budget. So do you have any problems with the, with the, with the document saying it's $750 million operating, operating deficit? I, there are great needs in the national park system uh, for we have a large maintenance backlog um, and we have great operating needs, but we're also in tough economic times, so I support the President's budget. And I'm assuming that was a yes then. Yes. Okay. Let me also talk about the core operations analysis. Um, you asked that that be discontinued last fall, but the controller said that core operations ensures that funds are spent in an efficient manner, that a park request for funding is credible and that there are adequate funds and staff to preserve and protect the resources which, for which parks are responsible. In this report, it attempts uh, to criticize efficiency that it says has been stifled by the trend to centralize government functions. Doesn't eliminating the core ops process exacerbate that problem and once again take you steps away from efficiency into centralization? Um, some of our programs are most efficient when they are centralized and some of our programs are most efficient when they're decentralized. The core operations program really was not a very um, good tool in making those determinations. I understand you were the only director of a region that didn't use that program. Um, actually, we did use it, um, but we adjusted it from the way it was being deployed. All right, sir, I appreciate that. I'm only on page two of a whole bunch of questions that I have here. We have a whole bunch of other people who are waiting in line. I'll, uh, I'll yield back and come back to you. Mr. Lujan, questions, comments? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and to all the committee members, it's an honor to be part uh, of this committee. I look forward to getting to know everyone better and, and working with them closely. Um, quickly, I, I want to jump into um, the importance of consultation as planning is put together, the importance of making sure and getting your views of uh, including uh, consultation with tribes, with locally impacted people in beautiful places uh, like New Mexico, where I call home. There's uh, been traditional uses of the land that date back before um, the establishment of many of the federal agencies. And uh, Mr. Jarvis, if you could just talk about the importance of that and uh, the critical nature of making sure that a diverse group of people are at the table when these plans are being put together or looked at for uh, uh, amending. Yes, sir. Um, one of the things that I did just in the last couple of weeks is I created a new assistant director for American Indian Relations and asked um, Gerard Baker, um, who is a 35-year career National Park Service employee, but he's also Mandan Hadatsa um, and um, is highly respected in, in First American communities around the country, uh, to serve s exactly in that role, uh, to reach out to um, First Americans uh, early uh, and um, work with elders uh, in terms of traditional uses <clears throat> traditional activities um, uh, on, uh, within National Park Service areas. So I think I'm absolutely deeply committed to working uh, very cooperatively with early consultation on all of these kinds of activities that may or may not affect um, uh, traditional activities within uh, park lands. And Mr. Chairman, that's something that I'm very interested in, in making sure that as we look at uh, broadening the diversity of the national narrative, um, sometimes preserving access and maintaining uh, historical, cultural, and traditional activities um, helps do that on its own. 
uh, by making sure that the communities are included and, and have the ability to do that. Um, engaging diverse audiences uh, along the same lines. And Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll close with the, this, this final question as to, uh, can you just briefly talk about the importance of relationships between concessionaires and national park managers as we talk about um, uh, the establishment of that competitive environment, recognizing in some areas where MPS has not been able to gain the um, uh, ownership of those interests, but in areas outside of that, if you can talk about the importance of those relationships and what we're doing to promote competition with some of the small businesses. The, the role of our concession uh, program is absolutely essential in providing quality visitor experiences around the system. They are um, 80 plus uh, private uh, businesses that uh, operate from very large to small mom and pop operations. Uh, they produce uh, over a billion dollars uh, gross. Um, they provide a revenue stream into the national park system uh, from franchise fees. But I view them as a partner. Um, uh, not just as a, as a separate sort of private entity. They are an essential component of providing services to the public. Um, and I, I think that they are doing uh, a great deal of good work um, in terms of the quality of their facilities, um, the sustainability of their facilities, uh, in terms of sort of the green uh, footprint um, that we're seeing. Uh, some of our concessioners really step up and do uh, great things because that is... Uh, we need to be sort of the standard bearer in that regard. Um, as always, uh, you know, they are contractual uh, concession relationships that we struggle with at times, and we have a large uh, backlog in dealing with uh, some of that. But um, uh, nevertheless, they're, they're a great partner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Thank you. Ms. Lummis, any questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Jarvis, uh, I note that uh, the Commission has talked a lot about education and about connecting people to the parks, but I don't see a real commitment to the widest possible access to the parks. And access is a big issue in my state of Wyoming where we're proud to have uh, the first national park, first national monument uh, in the country, and of course Grand Teton and uh, just great national treasures. Uh, and we want to make sure that people have access to our parks. Um, access was not one of the top four priorities on the top four priorities list. So how would you characterize the Park Service's commitment to ensure that every American has access to the parks? Um, I think, well, one of the keys to access to our national park system is our partnership with the Federal Highways Administration. And recently we also achieved $170 million in the Recovery Act to provide for road improvements uh, to provide safe um, and quality experiences in terms of road access uh, to the national parks. We also recently entered into an agreement with the International Mountain, Bi Mountain Biking Association uh, to provide opportunities for mountain biking um, in in our national parks as well. Um, so, um, and then also built in with our, our um, Recovery Act as well as um, uh, our land, uh, line item construction program and our repair, repair rehab program, significant investment in our trail systems uh, throughout the parks as well as a significant investment in our improvements in overall accessibility, meeting the, not only the the letter, but the intent of the America's, Americans' Disabilities Act uh, to ensure that we have access for, for all Americans. Thank you. Um, question about your strategic plan idea. I noticed that the Park Service supports creation of a strategic plan, uh, and I think strategic plans are great, um, but, but my concern is that they should consider the desires and needs of local communities. Uh, so, who do you envision would undertake the development of the plan? And then, um, I'm interested also in what role you think gateway communities should have in developing the plan. The, <clears throat> the, the development of, of a National Park System plan, I believe, is inherently a National Park Service responsibility. It is not something to be handed off to anyone else. Um, and we have um, built over years uh, I think a very good um, capability of working with communities and taking community input. This is not something that we should should or could ever do. 
um, without active engagement with the American public, both at the, at the national scale, but probably more importantly at the local scale, uh, working with communities to hear what they have to say, what's, what they, what's important to them that should be protected, uh, that helps preserve their, um, their economy, um, their local lifeways, um, their history. Um, I think those are, those are an essential component of any type of strategic uh, approach. Well, I, and I would comment on that. I have a bill to uh, ask you to look at the Heart Mountain uh, in Wyoming uh, possible designation. This was a bottoms-up effort. This came from a community that wanted to preserve the history uh, of the internment camps uh, during World War II that held so many uh, Japanese Americans um, and, and how that history uh, should be recognized and what a great example that is. I don't know that if you're doing strategic planning uh, without those kinds of grassroots organic efforts that you'd even know that those types of facilities have been preserved so well by local community organizations that now want to work with the Park Service to um, have those units considered. So um, as you're, I, I, I understand your desire to develop a strategic plan through the National Park Service, uh, but I'd also encourage you to uh, find ways to engage in some of these grassroots efforts to identify possible units that uh, you may not even be aware of uh, have uh, the kind of local support that Heart Mountain does. Um, another quick question, Mr. Chairman. Um, how does the designation of a national heritage area differ from other national park units? And if you establish a, a uniform process, uh, is your goal to ensure that heritage areas are not federally owned? And thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, the difference right now is that national heritage areas are established by an act of Congress uh, without any uh, study or recommendation by the National Park Service of whether or not they are uh, sustainable. Uh, the concept behind the heritage areas is that there, are, there is no federal ownership uh, and that any federal investment is only over a term and then it's to end. <clears throat> well, these heritage areas really don't end when the federal uh, investment uh, terminates. They really should be for the long term. And so in order for that to be sustainable, we want to make sure that there is a local governance, a local structure, uh, a revenue stream in order for these things to be maintained. And I think that is, um, uh, and to achieve their ultimate goals. So uh, what we're asking via the uh, recommendation that some legislation go forward is that um, task the National Park Service with going in and working with the community that is proposing a heritage area. Let us uh, evaluate and make a recommendation in terms of how that local governance would be established. We're not interested in any federal ownership in this process. We just, or we think the Heritage Area Program is a great program um, because it really is a locally driven, uh, locally sustainable. But we've had seen some experience in the the 40 plus that are there, the, those that have struggled uh, to be successful, and we want them to be successful. And all we're asking is that in order to create a program that's different is to give us a chance to study them first and then recommend to you how that structure would take would go forward. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Sangas? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's nice to see you, Director Jarvis. Uh, as you know, we've had our discussion. I'm from the 5th District of Massachusetts, and I'm fortunate to represent two really remarkable historical parks, the Minuteman National Park, which uh, protects the, the historic legacy of the beginnings of the American Revolution and the Lowell National Historical Park, which protects uh, and commemorates the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in our country. The, um, the Lowell Park was created in 1978, uh, and it's had a remarkable impact on the city. As you might know, it was a city that when the textile industry began to decline and go south, uh, went into steep decline, and it was only when uh, the National Park made a decision to come there and protect the great cultural and economic legacy of the city that it created a steady stream of funding that in turn spawned, the federal funding spawned increased state and local funding, uh, increased funding at the, um, in the non growth of the nonprofit sector, the educational sector, 
and now today very significant private sector investment. And it is a park that is part of the city. It, does, it has boundaries, but they are invisible. Uh, so in a sense, uh, it, it serves some of the purposes the National Park is looking at today. It's very much integrated into the everyday life of our citizens. Uh, we are a very diverse community, so just by living in this city, uh, you have access and get to experience a national park. So on many fronts, it has been uh, very important, obviously played a pivotal role in the rebirth of this city uh, as it now stands today, but I think very relevant uh, to what the National Park is doing as it looks forward. So my question really is, uh, given the importance of an urban historic park, uh, what the plans are for funding, continued funding, and how do you see it or do you see it as a model going forward? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I had the opportunity to visit Lowell um, and um, uh, with the Commission, as a matter of fact, and it was fascinating to watch the Commissioners uh, and, and, and me as well just uh, really fall in love with what has occurred in Lowell uh, in partnership uh, with the private sector, um, the city, and the National Park Service. And I think it is absolutely a model um, of how uh, a, a city that was struggling uh, economically, uh, socially, and that the investment of the National Park Service uh, coming in and restoring local pride in their own history and in their own story uh, and investing economically in the city has really turned things around. And we, there was no way we could have done it alone. Um, and in each of these cases, Lowell being a great example, but there are others. Uh, but not enough of them, frankly, of these models where the National Park Service brings something to the table uh, to, um, to restore uh, a, a piece of history, uh, but to integrate it, not in a sort of stilted and dusty kind of history way, but, a, but absolutely alive. And, um, and we saw that in Lowell, and, and I think that Lowell stands up there with the, the top few around the country, like Golden Gate National Recreation Area is another perfect one that is totally integrated into the city. And we are testing this model, um, for instance, at Rosie the River World War II homefront uh, in Richmond, California, where, again, we're integrating the historical uh, context with the city as well. Well, I think it's important to remember um, as, you, as you pursue this um, as a model, the ways in which the federal, the national park really representing the federal government really plays a catalytic role in that it really does incite uh, expanded investment, as we said, through the state and local governments, uh, through the private sector and the non growth of the nonprofit sector. So it has a multiplier effect, uh, not by itself, as you said, it could not do it, but it does spawn all this additional investment from many, many resources. And urban contexts really lend themselves to that uh, very readily. And so I uh, hope to see continued robust funding for this particular park, obviously, but um, I do think there's a model there that's relevant and worth encouraging. I have another, I can't see the time, so I don't know if I have more. Um, another question, this is a little more down in the weeds, but in recent years, the National Park has begun to consolidate local offices and centralize many functions. At the same time, the park has increased levels of bureaucracy and changed many of the processes for officials at the park level. What were your goals in doing this? Are these changes having a positive impact at the park level? And how are you measuring the effects that these changes are having? Um, <clears throat> very good question. Um, there are times when consolidation of offices make a lot of sense. Um, the National Park Service is seeking, and I am as the director, uh, as much efficiency as I can possibly wring out of our appropriated funds. Um, in many cases, we pay rents uh, for office space, um, and all of our funds, um, um, there are many demands for that. So we're seeking efficiencies where we can find in terms of consolidation of offices, uh, consolidation of programs. Um, but we're also evalu evaluating those against you know, service to the public and service to the resources as well. Um, in the Pacific, where I was the regional director for seven years, we found some great synergies in consolidation of certain functions, such as contracting, um, where they were virtually consolidated rather than physically consolidated. Um, and um, 
where uh, individuals could work for a central office but be field located. So we're, we're testing a variety of models right now throughout the system uh, against some evaluation criteria to make sure that they are effective um, as well because we're, uh, at times there is the perception that perhaps services will be redu reduced uh, when in reality perhaps services are actually going to be enhanced uh, by this process. But uh, we need to obviously work with our constituencies to ensure that they're still getting the services they expect. And are you reaching back to the superintendents to just get a feel for how these changes are working? We are. get some sense of the reality of it all? Yes. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Gomer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for being here, Director Jarvis. Uh, um, with regard to uh, the organ pipe um, area under your supervision in Arizona, um, that is considered wilderness area, correct? Portions of the park, yes, sir. Right, bordering Mexico, and yet because uh, portions, as you say, are wilderness area, uh, vehicles, including Border Patrol vehicles, are not allowed in there, correct? Uh, that is correct at certain times, yeah. under certain circumstances. Um, but for normal patrol, ensuring that our border is observed, since we know there are terrorists wanting to come in and trying to destroy our way of life and kill people, um, when are those times when someone can come in and patrol our border through those wilderness areas? Um, I had the opportunity to go down there recently and spend uh, time with both Border Patrol um, and the National Park Service uh, in Organ Pipe to, to better understand exactly that question, because I know that that's been a, a significant concern. It's a concern of mine as well. Well, it's only for those who are worried about people that want to blow us up, but go ahead. I have that concern as well. Um, so the, the bottom line is that the Border Patrol um, has the right to use those vehicles when they determine that there are exigent circumstances. And that is their, they can unilaterally make that decision. Uh, but the problem, in order to make those decisions about exigent circumstances, they have to be in areas where they can see the exigent circumstances exist. And if they cannot get a vehicle into where people are streaming in, then it's difficult to make those calls as to what exigent circumstances are. And so that, that's my concern. It, you know, we hear from uh, people who say we have got to protect those wilderness areas from vehicles coming in, and yet they do nothing about the roads that have formed through there from people illegally coming into the, to, to the country. And so it just seems like we are completely at cross purposes. We won't allow people in there who could preserve not only the integrity of our borders in this country, but also could protect those wilderness areas from people streaming through there and destroying this amazing landscape. So I, I'm quite concerned that because of the restrictions on the use of any kind of vehicles, uh, as I understand, helicopters could go across, but they cannot land. Uh, you're saying if it's exigent circumstances, they can land, correct? Absolutely. Uh, but uh, that just seems to be a real problem, and, and since time is limited, uh, and I would urge you to please look at that more carefully and try to work out some agreement, because what's happening is the utter destruction of these uh, wilderness areas. But we have the uh, Mojave Desert situation where there was a cross that was taken down, um, and now uh, we had seen in the news that someone had put up a replica uh, because of the position that's so anti-God uh, by what uh, the Park Service. It seems that uh, uh, not only was it a, 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 as the Park Service seemed to have a problem with the cross, but I, I had World War II veterans up here uh, last week, and they were really... Um, grieving over the fact that a World War II memorial would not mention God. And when we look at the incredible memorials from the Washington Monument, Lincoln Memorial, Jefferson Memorial, all these great old memorials 
that talk about our Creator and God and, and Providence at Laos Day, oh praise be to God, on top of the uh, Washington Monument. These veterans were bemoaning the fact that new memorials over the last 10 or 20 years completely have hostility toward the mention of God, completely uh, stripped of it. Uh, have you found anything out at all about the taking of that cross? Was that the Park Service that took down the replica? Or uh, do you know who, who did? I do not have current information, but I would be absolutely glad to get back to you. Um, I honestly just came in from the Gulf last night and was not briefed on the current situation at Mojave. Um, uh, but I, I know we are treating the stealing of the cross as a, as a crime, um, and we are pursuing that from a law enforcement investigation standpoint. What about the taking down of the replica? Um, now, I, again, I don't know the exact situation on that, and I'll be glad to get back to you on what... Well, because you understand, happened. if, if uh, the Park Service says, well, we'll treat it as a crime, but you don't allow the replacement, then it, it appears the Park Service would unwittingly, or perhaps wittingly, but hopefully unwittingly, be complicit in the accomplishment of the effort of the thieves. But I see my time's yield, uh, yield back. Thank you. Ms. Capps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Director Jarvis, for your good work, which I can personally speak to uh, in my relationship with you and in the, your previous position. I represent the Channel Islands National Park in the Pacific off the central coast of California. I have some questions about it. First, two really quick questions. Uh, per the court-ordered settlement agreement, whose responsibility is it for the removal of the deer and elk uh, on Santa Rosa Island? Uh, it's the responsibility of Vale and Vickers. Thank you. And what has the Park Service done to ensure that the terms of the court-ordered settlement agreement are met? Um, we have instituted our own survey of the, um, the animals. Um, we um, wanted to be sure they are in their court-ordered 25 percent reduction phase now per year, and um, we wanted to ensure that the actual numbers uh, resulted in a 25 percent reduction. We've also recommended uh, to Vale and Vickers that they uh, um, take specific actions to reduce the, um, the, the population um, as well. Thank you. And so the Park Service has been providing guidance to Vale and Vickers? Yes, we have. Thank you. I wanted to get that on the record and I want to put in a good word for, put in a good word for your excellent superintendent of that park, uh, Russell Gallup, his way to, to address this particular situation with the, the people involved. Um, Last year, the Park Service used recovery funds to install solar panels at Channel Islands headquarters to reduce its carbon emissions and energy bills. As you know, the Second Century Commission report calls for Park Service operations to be carbon neutral by 2016, followed by visitor services to be carbon neutral by 2020. That's a big challenge. Are you committed to meeting these deadlines, and what actions um, are, is MPS taking to, to meet some of these goals? Um, we are absolutely committed to getting as close as we can to being carbon neutral. There's, there are many challenges to that. But for instance, I believe the National Park Service and the units of the National Park System and the facilities that we, that we manage, develop, um, and construct should be an exemplar uh, in terms of, of sustainability. Um, so we are building facilities that, that meet or exceed uh, the very highest standards in, in sustainability. For instance, the new visitor center at Lassen Volcanic is, uh, is LEED Platinum. Um, and <clears throat> where you not only uh, can learn about the, the volcano itself, but you can also learn about the sustainability of the physical facility. I've set the standard within our development advisory board, which reviews all constructions, that they will not accept any project that does not meet LEED standards. Um, we are also working cooperatively with our utilities, such as Southern California Edison, uh, from your part of the world, uh, to develop large solar arrays in parks in partnership, for instance, at Joshua Tree National Park. Um, with the assistance of the utility, we developed a very large solar array that provides shade structure to our maintenance facility and produces uh, about 65 percent of the power demands for the headquarters area as well. So we're looking for all of those kinds of opportunities. I think the big challenge for us is historic structures. Um, we are is not really yet 
Um, but we're working with the National Trust and the Advisory Council to develop standards for sustainability around historic buildings as well. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, the Channel Islands National Park is finishing up its management plan. One of the goals highlighted thus far is to continue monitoring and protecting kelp forests off, the, off all the islands, a project it shares with the adjacent National Marine Sanctuary. And I have been very supportive of this partnership and I thank you for it. Um, my question has to do, even though this is quite a different uh, scenario than the one my colleague uh, Ms. Tong Songas asked you about, but um, what are some of the additional ways that the Park Service can work with other federal agencies to anticipate, to mitigate, to protect resources? And I'm thinking particularly in our area of the strong uh, connection between the Park Service and NOAA um, uh, with respect to the sanctuary, which it has a, a responsibility for. And I mentioned the kelp forest. Are there some other uh, areas you want to highlight, either in this region or in some other regions, of, of this kind of synergy that can come between federal agencies and enhancing, uh, multiplying the effect, if you will, of, of goals that are shared? I think the Channel Islands is a perfect example of that kind of collaborative relationship over a, within a, a system and absolutely the relationship we have there with NOAA um, and the Marine Sanctuary System is a, is a great model. I also want to mention the State of California has been a, a great partner there as well um, in terms of both um, the protection and monitoring of the Marine Sanctuary and the kelp forests uh, around Channel Islands. There are other examples. Um, where we work very cooperatively with adjacent land managers um, in, uh, on the island of, of Maui uh, in Hawaii. Um, we are working very uh, uh, cooperatively with uh, the state uh, in protection and the move uh, to control the expansion of exotic species like Myconia, uh, which is a very invasive uh, tree, uh, to keep them out of, uh, of the park. And so the work is very cooperative, all external, uh, to uh, the park as well. And there are other uh, great examples um, in, uh, in the Dakotas, working uh, closely with the tribes and the state in preserving um, you know, waterfowl nesting areas, uh, connectivity, uh, and areas for bison um, that, uh, that move in and out of the park. So there's a number of those kinds of examples. And I really think that that's sort of the future, is really working collaboratively, collaboratively across, uh, across these boundaries. Thank you very much. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Director Jarvis, and uh, thank you for taking some time recently to talk with me and listen patiently to my obsession with Fort McHenry in my district, <laughs> lifelong obsession. Uh, and of course, we're, we're working hard to get that ready for the bicentennial <coughs> celebration that is coming up 2012. I wanted to ask two questions. One is, uh, on the issue of the backlog, the maintenance backlog and so forth, I imagine that uh, given how sizable that is, that you, you must have some kind of a triage approach to it. And I was wondering if you could describe that a little bit. Um, does it, does it um, consist of sort of triaging at each uh, national park site, what gets done and what doesn't get done, or there's some or there are there decisions made that there's certain sites where you you want to make sure all of the backlog is is addressed, even if that means other sites uh, maybe don't get any attention. How do you how do you manage and balance what I imagine is a very difficult um, set of choices with respect to the backlog? One of the great things that occurred over the last uh, eight years, particularly with the focus of the last administration, was, a, was a, a quantitative analysis of our maintenance backlog. A great deal of investment was placed in terms of both setting priority on our assets, um, sort of ranking their, their where they fit, so critical systems uh, versus sort of nice to have in, a, in a, a very quantitative scale, and then their current condition um, and then what it would take in order to get them up to a good condition. Um, this has been done at the asset level, then at the park level, then at the regional level, and then at the national level. Um, we're in the process of producing what are called park asset management plans, or PAMPs. Um, these are essentially a ranking of, of both condition and asset priority uh, for um, the entire national park system. So they are developed at the park level, and then they roll up into a larger system. 
Uh, we have great analytical capability now to look at where um, the critical systems in the, in, the, in the national park system, you know, things like wastewater, water treatment, roads uh, that provide uh, uh, key access, just really the, the core components that are necessary to keep parks functional. And then other assets that sort of fall uh, at the lower end of the chart. And there are some assets that, frankly, we need to get rid of. Um, and so we are focusing also on removal of facilities or replacement of those facilities um, that, uh, that would eliminate some of our maintenance backlog. So we're, um, this is actually, a, I'm kind of an analytical kind of person. I, I find this very interesting. And so we are trying to focus on where the best investment is going to be of our limited dollars in these, uh, in these key assets. So I think we have very much the analytical capability of really focusing in sort of a triage way on our most critical assets. The second question I had is, um, I think I mentioned to you when we met previously my interest in environmental education, getting kids outdoors. Um, I've authored something called the No Child Left Inside Act, which is to try to promote outdoor education and integrate that more fully into our instructional program across the country. We have a lot of uh, folks that are part of a coalition that support that. You mentioned um, the uh, new position of Associate Director for Education Interpretation. Um, and I imagine that that would be kind of the point person, the contact person for our efforts with No Child Left Inside yes, and similar kinds of initiatives. And I just wanted to yes, confirm sir. that with you. Okay. Thanks very much. I'll yield back. Thank you. Mr. Kind. Mr. Kind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Director Jarvis, thank you so much for, for being here and for your, your testimony today. See, a couple of issues I was hoping, since we have such an abbreviated time, maybe the follow-up and maybe we can arrange a meeting at some point. But one is dealing with the expiration of the memorandum of understanding between the Park Service and the Peace Corps as far as international park units and what's happening there. I, I've always believed that, that two are great national treasures that we have. Is one is the Library of Congress, one is the public lands, the parks system itself. Dr. Billington has been doing a wonderful job reaching out to other countries as far as the preservation of their founding documents and, and archives and providing assistance. And I know we've had a wonderful program as far as helping other countries establish their own park system, but I know the memorandum of understanding expired. I'm wondering what needs to be done, if anything, to bring that up to speed. Secondly, uh, one of the best things that my wife Tawny and I decided to do when our children were at a very early age is we vowed that during the August break, we were going to take them backpacking in a different national park for one week. And we've done that for the last six years. And it's been just a wonderful opportunity. But the kids today, and obviously we've got a nature deficit with the younger generation. That's something we all should be concerned about. Are learning differently. They're absorbing differently. They're being stimulated differently than what maybe you and I were when we were growing up at that age. And he had mentioned about the, the, the technology programs now, trying to connect our kids and get them excited in that. And I was hoping to be able to pursue in a little more detail what partnerships are being established for getting our children more interested in the park service by using the technology that they seem to be addicted to today and respond to very well. But the one issue I wanted you to address today before the committee is, is in regards to park personnel morale. I mean, we were very concerned about some of the surveys and studies coming out showing the low level of morale with Park Service employees. Um, and yet they're one of the most important resources that we have going for us in the park system. Why is that? And what steps are being done to try to turn that around? If you could address that uh, for us. Um, we are concerned about the, uh, the uh, survey work that was done by the best places to work that did indicate that the, uh, there are a number of factors um, in in uh, National Park Service employees that are raised concern. Um, <clears throat> in order to address that, uh, we have uh, created a workplace enrichment committee um, headed up by a former superintendent from San Francisco Maritime um, and staffed it up to, uh, to begin to um, take a deeper dive into the organization to understand what these issues are um, and to, uh, uh, to then, under my uh, direction, to invest in, the, in fixing um, those kinds of things. We've also, uh, one of the second century uh, commissioners was um, Margaret Wheatley, who is an organizational uh, consultant and um, author on these kinds of issues. And, 
and uh, uh, Meg has offered her assistance uh, to, uh, to the National Park Service uh, to, uh, to help us better understand these issues as well. Um, the, the issues are complex uh, with the National Park Service. Most employees love their jobs. Um, they love uh, what they do. They dedicate uh, way beyond the, the normal uh, you know, paid hours. Um, they volunteer. They travel to parks on their days off. Uh, many of them are back in the park on their days off doing, uh, doing work, and it, it's a way of life, um, as it was with me. I've been in this service for 34 years. Um, but I think uh, they also have high aspirations uh, for the agency. And uh, to a certain degree, the Second Century Commission report uh, calls upon those high aspirations. And um, they, par they want the park system to achieve these broader goals. And, um, and they felt perhaps for a while we have not been achieving that for a variety of reasons. And so we're, we're going to invest in a lot of that over the coming years. So you think it's more dealing with aspirational objectives with the personnel and not salary, living conditions, work conditions, things of that nature? It's a mixed. Um, I think uh, some of it is workplace. Um, I recently saw some of the worst park housing I've ever seen in my life um, and, um, and appalling living conditions uh, for our employees and we are uh, trying to fix that um, as well. Um, they tend not to complain about these things and just go for it anyway, uh, but we are going to be uh, looking at that. So I think it's a combination of aspirational and, uh, and local issues. Well, I tell you, from personal experience, you know, having contact with a lot of the park personnel throughout the years, they're, they're tremendous. I mean, they're great resources, great advocates for the park system, uh, helpful uh, with the people visiting, and anything we can do as far as the committee is concerned to help as far as turning those surveys around. So it's heading in the positive direction. Again, we're interested in engaging you on. Thank and then hopefully we'll have an opportunity to follow up as far as the memorandum of understanding and also some of the youth activities, youth programs specifically targeting the children of our country to get them excited, as my friend from Maryland said, being outdoors again and exploring the wonders of our public lands. Uh, they truly are national treasures. Thank you again, Director Jarvis. I'd be glad Thank to you, Mr. come Chairman. by and talk to you that Great. detail. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Palatano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Director Jarvis. Uh, I think most of the points have been covered, except I've got a few of my own that I thought I'd bring to uh, actually dovetailing in uh, Ms. Christensen's uh, questions regarding the diversity of your workforce. And on that, um, dovetailing the outreach to the areas where there are more minorities that might be interested or beginning to get interested in making the Park Service a uh, future job uh, um, um, career, if you will. Have you or are you or will you do outreach to the members of Congress in the areas where you know that you have a high concentration of minorities? Um, could be Asian, it could be Hispanic, it could be uh, African American. To be able to have some kind of a program. Now in California, the, um, because I'm from California, uh, state government has allowed uh, cable to have two access lines for every city in, in California, uh, public access and government access. Now, uh, every city would be able to run any PSA that you have to promote going to the parks, but you've got to get it to them to run. Uh, secondly, they would be probably more um, in, in, in other areas is if you were going to reach the local community colleges to provide job training, have the community colleges in those areas be able to put on uh, um, classes, if you will, uh, for uh, um, the diverse things that you would handle, including a possibility of future job. They do it for law enforcement, they do it for firemen, why not for park service? Um, and especially those of us who, uh, in, 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 in hearing the, your response to the dejected workforce, uh, salary, the budget, is it, uh, I know that the budget has been very minimal in the past decade. Am I correct? So are you getting, su not sufficient, can not, never be sufficient, but additional funding to be able to carry out all the things that we talk about and to be able to better the park service delivery to the residents? I'm sorry, that's a mouthful. That's okay. Those are all good points. Um, let me give you a couple of examples of where we are doing exactly what you suggest. 
<clears throat> in, in California in particular. At the University of California Merced campus, the newest of the 10 campuses of the University of California, and the most diverse uh, of all the UC system, <clears throat> we have a specific program in terms of outreach to the community. Uh, UC Merced's focused is predominantly in the Central Valley. Um, and um, we actually have uniformed National Park Service employees that are college students on the campus working in the uh, student center that not only uh, plan trips into Yosemite or Sequoia Kings Canyon or other parks, but also recruit uh, for seasonal positions uh, in May I parks. interrupt you, sir, because my time is limited? Yes. Would you kindly uh, maybe take that as a program to be able to transfer to L.A.? L.A. County is 12 million people. And while we may not have many mountains, we do have Santa Monica close by, and we also have St. Gabriel Mountains. So Merced, beautiful area, but it, I don't know how many people they have. My county, like I said, has 12 million people. The city is 4 million. So we need to be able to do maybe a little more in the areas where you have more density to be able to attract the children who then will take their families to the parks. I know mine did. One of my goals is to take these programs that I know are successful and replicate them in places like uh, Los Angeles. So, yes, absolutely. Well, I'd love to be able to be uh, uh, some kind of resource to you because I know that we've done a lot through uh, some of our uh, San, uh, the, um, uh, San Gabriel Mountain Conservancy. Um, and I was uh, uh, interested in uh, Mr. Kine's mention to um, maybe find out how to get the Peace Corps working with you again. Would it take legislation? Is it something that you can do without legislation? We can do it without legislation. As a matter of fact, I have a briefing statement on the renewal of that MOU with me in my briefcase. And then the last question, Mr. Chair, uh, and I'll have more for the record, is uh, you're working with uh, U.S. Mexican for sister parks on the border. There's going to be an interparliamentary meeting in Campeche, I believe in July. It would be nice to have information so that we can then believe, uh, uh, begin uh, talking to the senators and the members of, of their state legislatures in Congress. Uh, I know the president is very interested in some of those things. President uh, Felipe Calderon is very interested in the water aspect. We can hopefully maybe dovetail some of that, those efforts into parks. And any information that you may have would be ideal for us to be able to at least if we can't cover it during the session, at least provide them with information for them to follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Bishop. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jarvis, once again, I don't want to sound totally negative. I will. That's my job. There are some things uh, that you are doing of which I am very proud, especially in the area of historic preservation. However, in the document that has been presented to us, and that's why I asked who wrote it, because there are so many red flags that it's hard to actually fight your way through it as far as keywords that are in there. For example, and I just want you quickly to respond to the one. Today, many of our most serious threats of our parks comes from beyond their borders. We know that we can no longer draw a line on a map and declare a place protected. Are you seriously recommending buffer zones around all national parks? Uh, no, sir, we're not recommending buffer zones. Which is one of the reasons why I ask who wrote the language, the prose in here has problematic concepts here that I wish had been much more specifically directed. As, and especially when you go on to the next, next paragraph, or I'm sorry, the next column, and they do an act, actual attack on agriculture. That's, those are six, some problems just in the prose that you've given to us. Let me ask you another one. The, the um, so-called park scorecard appears to be the successor of the core ops that I mentioned earlier. On February 29th of last year, did you attend a meeting with, N uh, with the Park Service and the NPCA Management Partnership where you discussed the so scorecard for budgeting? Um, I may have. I can't remember, and I, I honestly can't remember what I did last February. But a scorecard is a, a, an important tool, and we are using it. So is it appropriate to develop budgeting at a high level in private meetings like that one on the 24th? Uh, with agendas that are driven by interest groups with the National Park Service? What, um, the, um, what the Center for Park Management is offering is consulting services to do analysis, not, not recommendations, not uh, 
not, you, uh, but they, they provide consulting services for us to do like an analysis on scorecard metrics. And you find that, you find that appropriate then? Um, uh, obviously, you just said you did. Would you go back and check your records on February 24th? The last time I had the chance of sitting next to you with Congressman Hastings and a couple of senators and the secretary who were in the room, you had a different added answer to that, which I think uh, was, which I think there was an effort to try and re change that particular, fix the record on that particular answer. So I'd appreciate it if you check that again and then get back to me and to, to uh, Congressman Hastings as was originally implied. Let me ask you also one other thing about the Treasured Landscapes Initiatives. Um, there are emails that said that you, that, that you were involved in the Treasured Landscape Initiative and developed certain Park Service proposals. Were the projects of that proposals your own initiative or did they come from the Secretary or did they come from the President's office? The Secretary of Interior asked uh, the National Park Service to propose to him um, how he would approach his treasured landscapes agenda. So we provided, uh, uh, we've had um, a number of meetings with the secretary at his request um, to. Uh, so the proposals that you came up with, were they from your office or were they from the secretary or were they from the White House? I have no knowledge of anything from the White House, um, uh, um, but there were proposals from the secretary and from the National Park Service. That's an interesting concept. When, what projects did you actually submit then from the Treasured Landscape Initiative? Um, well, one was, uh, as I've testified here today, is the authority to redo the National Park System Plan, where we would look at broad themes uh, in, the in this country, American history themes, um, and where um, potentially new areas could be established to tell those stories. And those were the initiatives that came from your office? Were there others? No, those are the kinds of initiatives that we, we requested. Do you have a list of the ones that you proposed that came from your office? And will you provide that to us? Um, all requests for that kind of information have to go through our solicitor's office in terms of their determination of whether or not they're uh, internal and deliberative. That I'm not in the position to provide that unless the, um, approved through the, through the solicitor's office. If the solicitor approves that, are you willing to, pr to provide that information? If the solicitor approves it, yes. Were, the, were any of those areas and areas that were developed where there could have been resources that could be developed that would make us less dependent on foreign sources of energy? Um, I do not have any information on that. I have no idea. So let me get this straight on this, the, you know, the Treasured Landscape Initiative which the Solicitor General at one time says there's a process that should be involved in that. The proposals for those initiatives did not come from the White House. They actually came from the Department of Interior and your office presented some of those initiatives that were there. That would be correct. And, and it is, and you don't, and, and you do or do not think it would be appropriate for Congress then to see what those listed initiatives are. I'm not in the position to make that judgment. That judgment is, uh, is made by the, our solicitor's office. Not if you me. were in the position to make that judgment, do you think it would be appropriate for Congress to know what you have proposed I, into those, in those areas? I, I know my position, and that is the director of the National Park Service, and I'm going to stay in that position <laughs> and not speculate on, the, on uh, anything beyond my, uh, my well, position. That's good. Maybe you should go through what the solicitor general uh, a decade ago said with the process to realize that when you're dealing with those types of situations, they're supposed to come from the president first, not necessarily coming from your office. And if they are, then Congress should be a player in that particular area. I, Mr. Chairman, I have a whole bunch of other questions. I will try and, you know, you've got people here that other have questions. I don't want to belabor this point. Uh, sir, I will be coming back with other questions that I do have on the scorecard concept. As I said, there is some verbiage in here that I have some specific issues. I would love to be able to say what is the priority of the Park Service. You have a line in there that said at one time in 1916 the idea was for entertainment. Now you have everything from saving the planet, which is actually a phrase that's in there, and educating children and kids who go to parks actually are smarter than kids who don't go to parks. I would love you, even in your testimony, gave us four priorities, which, to be honest, I cannot identify outside of bureaucraties what those initiatives are. I would love to be able at some time just to say, I've read your documents and I can't say this is the priority of what the Park Service is about and what they intend to do and have those specific and direct. 
I have some problems, some significant problems with the verbiage in this document. As I said, there are keywords that throw all sorts of, of, of verbal documents from the buffer zone question to the fact you actually did attack agricultural interests in the United States in this particular document. Shouldn't be there. That's not appropriate. I have questions on the funding sources. I have questions on how, why you've received $750 million in the Stimulus Act, but you've only spent 92. I have some significant questions of heritage areas, especially when the chairman of the full committee is so wont to say that the entire state of Tennessee is a heritage area, which has a hard part of presenting how we're going to do initiatives with local government. We have to come up with, cons with some precise areas of how we move into heritage areas in the future, which can because those areas are significantly di different than when Congress and Vento actually initiated that process. We've got to come to those kind of conclusions. And what I would like to do, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just so other people can still have a chance of talking to you before Mr. Jarvis has to go and submit those to the record, <laughs> if I can get a response back on the questions I submit to the record, not that I've had problems with the Park Service before in getting stuff back from, from you all, but if I could do that, I would be more than happy to do that to try and move this process along. I do want to say there are areas in which I am, I am pleased in what you have done, but there are a whole lot of areas in which I have some significant concerns, concerns especially if this document is going to be the one that guides us into the future. And I think it would be good to try and talk at some other, at some other place in time. I'd be glad to come by. And Thank you, sir. Mr. Hensley. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to deliver some good news. I was at Timpanogos uh, National Monument in Utah a couple weekends ago and um, saw a young man painting a sign with nice brown paint, and he was doing a great job on behalf of the National Park System. I'm an old painter, so I appreciate good painting. Well, he great. Was, it was really making it look really good. Second good news is, um, I was impressed with the little brochure that they hand out there. It had a section on what Americans could do to deal with climate change, what you could do on, to deal to reduce carbon emissions. And I thought that was uh, really a good thing for the Park Service to help Americans uh, have that information. And I appreciate your sharing that information with Americans at your service. So hats off to your work you're doing there. But it isn't fully working because we're losing a lot of the ecosystems that the park is responsible for because of, of climate change. Um, so here's one question. Uh, the Glacier National Park is predicted not to have glaciers, I'm told, within the next century because of, because of climate change. And the National uh, Science Foundation and a whole host of federal agencies believe that's primarily caused by human activities, the release of carbon dioxide and, and methane. So the question is, when all of the glaciers are gone in Glacier National Park, because we didn't deal with our energy crisis, what are we going to call Glacier National Park? Well, I hope it'll still be Glacier National Park, um, because it was, um, the uh, landscape there was, uh, was carved by glaciers. Um, you know, we may have to call it, uh, you know, the park formerly known as Glacier. Um, um, but <clears throat> nevertheless, it is going to change uh, Glacier in a variety of ways, and there are cascading effects that come from the loss of the glaciers, water temperature in the streams, um, uh, change in vegetation um, that will result in, in a warming climate. So, um, and Glacier is not alone in, that, uh, in those changes that we are seeing. Um, I think, as I've stated in, in previous testimony before the chairman, that uh, uh, climate change is going to be one of the greatest challenges the national park system faces in this next century. Well, I'm afraid that's the case. And, the, and the, the glaciers are not just the ice. They're the keystone of the whole ecosystem there. And my parents used to work with the Student Conservation Association up, up on Mount Rainier, revegetating some of those alpine meadows that if there's a heaven on earth, I think that's where it is. And they're fed by the glaciers, essentially. That's what keeps those whole alpine meadows healthy. And so seeing the loss of those is, is, is very devastating to a lot of us and my constituents who love those places. Let me suggest there is something we can do about that, which is to pass a clean energy bill this year to try to keep the places pristine and healthy that you have jurisdiction on. And one of my empathies for your position is, is that you're responsible for these treasured landscapes, but it's really the Energy Department 
and maybe the interior department that really are responsible, we need to give them the tools so they can come up with clean energy so we can keep the national parks healthy. And I hope that I hope that that'll um, that happen. I wanted to ask you about uh, the National Park Service's uh, threats uh, from the oil spill. And I know there are quite a number of areas, the Big Cypress National Preserve, Biscayne National Park, DeSoto National Memorial, even Dry Tortugas if it gets into the Loop cor uh, Current, Everglades. Could you describe what your situation is uh, with the Park Service on protecting those areas right now? Do you have any sort of um, emergency budget that you can draw on to deal with those challenges with your parks right now? Or do you have an unlimited well to draw from, from British Petroleum? How, do, how is this working for you? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm serving as an innocent commander down there right now. And so for, there are seven units of the National Park System that are interior to the Gulf. And then Biscayne, uh, we are counting as the eighth, uh, just being around the turn on uh, there are also 33 National Wildlife Refuges also uh, potentially threatened by the, by the oil spill. Our first step has been to deploy um, boom material. Uh, Gulf Islands National Seashore is the one that is closest uh, to the oil spill, in many cases only of, uh, less than 10 miles from the slick. Um, and so we've been uh, deploying boom. We are at 100 percent of our planning level in terms of protection of Gulf, of Gulf Islands National Seashore um, the, uh, to protect uh, predominantly the uh, wetlands and estuaries and, and seagrass beds that, that are on the back sides of the islands. Um, and we've done that. Um, we're also out with teams of biologists um, and archaeologists to document the, the pre-existing conditions on all of the national parks uh, in the Gulf. Um, Frankly, we think that uh, for the South Florida parks, uh, Dry Tortugas, Big Cypress Everglades, and Biscayne, it is predominantly going to be a tar ball um, event uh, because the oil is weathering. Um, we have been working very actively with the BP chemists and, uh, and our own scientists to better understand what is changing in the oil as it moves uh, through the Gulf and potentially into the loop current. It is in the loop current. Uh, but it weathers actively. This particular oil is a, is a low sulfur, high volatile, uh, a sort of a, what they call a sweet crude. Uh, it, does, um, it does weather uh, in the water column and on the surface and results in, the, in tar balls. Tar balls uh, are problematic, but they're not particularly toxic. Um, and um, so we have teams in place uh, to uh, gather uh, tar balls as they appear anywhere within the National Park System. Uh, they go to the lab uh, to determine uh, their source. We can fingerprint them fairly closely uh, to uh, Deepwater uh, Horizon um, 252 uh, to determine if their source is coming from that. So I think, at least from the National Park System, we're pretty well prepared. We are doing this uh, under the Unified Command, which is being paid for by uh, BP uh, for our um, uh, for our response at this point. And all of that uh, is, uh, we, we do uh, very extensive cost accounting uh, in this process, and that is all being paid for by the responsible party at this time. Thank you. Mr. Ensley, and uh, in deference to uh, the travel and the responsibility that you have now, if there's uh, no other follow-up questions, let me thank you, Mr. Director. And oh, yeah, Ms. Palatano. Very quickly, um, there was a, an indication of invasive species, um, whether it's the pine beetle in the forest, uh, in the parks, whether it's the tamarask uh, uh, being er eradicated by Japanese beetles, which are now infecting or uh, moving out in, in Utah at, at uh, Moab. Uh, what, what are you doing on those areas? Because that also is uh, um, a drain on your budget, I'm sure. The advance of exotic species is a major concern for the National Park Service, and, and a lot of it is driven by uh, climate change. Buffalo grass in the, in the southwest being another example. We have exotic plant management teams deployed uh, across the system that are actively uh, attacking uh, these, uh, the spread of these species, uh, and obviously working very cooperatively with uh, state agencies that uh, control uh, weed control districts. Um, and, uh, and other agencies as well on this. So uh, it, is a, it is a huge, huge challenge, but we're not, we're not taking it laying down. 
Okay, um, in Colorado, they're using some of the pine beetle kill to uh, take the uh, uh, oil out of the pine and then mulch it to give to cattle, which I thought was great. Mm. Um, also, um, if you could implement uh, photovoltaic or geomass or wind power in many of your uh, sites, how much money do you think you could save? Um, that's a question I'd have to get back to you on and calculate. I think that there are places uh, like the Mojave Desert, um, Joshua Tree and others where we can deploy these resources. There are other places that we can't just because of it's a historic facility, um, though we're, we're finding uh, unique ways to do it. We have a, uh, a project on Alcatraz Island where we're going to lay solar panels on the central cell block. Uh, where they wouldn't be seen by the public. So they're, we're looking at all kinds of innovative ways to do this, but ultimately we, we probably could never deploy enough solar wind or alternative energy within the national parks to cover all of our energy demands. We're going to have to do that in partnership uh, with others. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Loomis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one follow-up on Mrs. Napolitano's earlier discussion with you when you were talking about the students at Merced uh, and what a neat uh, program that is. I'd encourage you to uh, incorporate Native Americans also into the discussion of uh, opportunities for young people. Uh, as I look at uh, the Wind River Indian Reservation in Wyoming, it's uh, proximity to Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks and uh, how we might incorporate young people on the reservation uh, into uh, interactions with tourists on the park. It, it, it provides some opportunities uh, for Native Americans. Rose, uh, there's a, a Park Service director at Devil's Tower, who is uh, a Native American from the Rosebud uh, Reservation. Uh, she's been a great addition, and uh, I think that those uh, are, are great programs. I want to applaud you for it and, and uh, uh, ask you to consider Native Americans uh, in, in those types of programs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, there's no further questions. Mr. Director, thank you. Thank you for the job you're doing right now and the job that you are doing as director. Uh, I think the commission's blueprint and uh, recommendations are, uh, are important and uh, I want to uh, extend my uh, appreciation for you working with them. And as we approach that centennial, uh, down the road, looking at an implementation schedule that both involves resources, funding, and priorities. And I think that's where we'll be going as a consequence of the hearing today and as a consequence of the report that uh, the very important report that's before us. So thank you and for being here today. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me invite the next panel up. Let me uh, welcome and thank uh, our panelists for your uh, your valuable time and uh, and for the time that you're uh, giving this hearing. We appreciate it very much. Uh, let me begin with Dr. St uh, Steve Lockhart, Chairman of the Board, Nature Bridge, San Francisco. Welcome, sir, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, members, and thank you for the opportunity to present testimony before this distinguished subcommittee. It's an honor and a privilege. In 2016, as you're aware, the National Park Service will celebrate its centennial. And in 2008, uh, the Second Century Commission was convened, an independent body charged with developing a vision that expands the national park idea for the next 100 years. We are a group of distinguished private citizens, including scientists, educators, conservationists, business people, and leaders in state and national government. We met at several national parks around the country and engaged in dialogue with citizens and experts. We are grateful for the leadership provided by our co-chairs, former Senators Bennett Johnston and Howard Baker. And as co-chair of the Commission's Education and Learning Subcommittee, it is on this topic that I will be most expansive. However, our report and recommendations are reflected in all the testimony you will hear today, and I ask that my re remarks be considered within that context. 
One of our first experiences as a commission involved a visit to the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. There we joined a group of fifth graders involved in a program in which students adopt a designated plot of land and remove non-native plants and restore native species. They learn about the water cycle, soil, insects, and other ecological concepts. Notably, these were all children from the urban environment of Los Angeles, the majority of whom were being introduced for the first time to this national park right in their own backyard. Whereas park visitors typically do not reflect our nation's diversity, these students did re reflect the diversity of their local communities. Due to this positive and memorable experience, many of these children return to introduce their parents and family members to the park. This is a powerful example of the ability of education to engage future generations and to inspire a personal connection with our national parks. Education ranks among our nation's highest priorities. As one of the largest providers of both informal and formal educational experiences, the national parks offer an opportunity to engage in place-based lifelong learning. Just as the Organic Act established the framework needed to maintain the parks during the first century, education has courted the success of the parks during the next century. The Commission recommends that education be at the forefront of the National Park Service agenda and that Congress establish a clear legislative mandate for education as a fundamental purpose of the parks. Education is provided through the visitor experience, ranger-led interpretation, formal educational programs, and academic research. It is provided by the National Park Service but in equal measure by partners and volunteers. Students who participate in park educational programs show measurable improvement in academic performance and achieve higher test scores, all of which helps to further the primary objective of enhancing the quality of education in America. NatureBridge is an example of one of several partner organizations for which 40 years has provided week-long residential field science programs in national parks and currently educates 40,000 middle school and high school children per year. As chair of the board of NatureBridge and as a parent of a program alumnus, I can testify to the transformative nature of these types of park experiences. Interestingly, four current park superintendents are alumni of our programs who acknowledge that the seed of interest in a career was planted at that early stage. In order to support its human capital needs for the 21st century, the Park Service must develop a pipeline, creating a ladder of learning, including service learning that plants these seeds of interest and captures the imagination of young people. For the vast majority who will not pursue a career with the National Park Service, the benefit to society of developing leadership, stewardship, and a sense of personal responsibility for the environment cannot be overstated. Within the National Park Service, nodes of educational excellence exist, but have evolved inconsistently due to chronic underfunding and lack of institutional commitment to professional development for interpretation and education staff. Education is also a powerful tool to engage the broader American public a public which is increasingly diverse and who struggle at times to find a personal connection with our national parks. We should recognize and support the vital role the National Park Service and education and interpretation staff play in engaging this diverse public. Historically, important stories have been missing from the chronicle embedded in our parks. Which of our nation's stories are told, how they are told, and by whom are critical elements of making a visitor experience relevant to a diverse multicultural society. The old concept of a ranger as an authority who provides education for the public must be replaced with the ranger who facilitates with audiences and engages communities and partners to provide a relevant experience. Finally, if we expect to maintain a vibrant system of national parks into the second century, it is critical for the National Park Service to create and foster a culture conducive to achieving workforce diversity reflective of the public it serves. We see our national parks as the centerpiece of a 21st century America which celebrates our shared national heritage. Our recommendations are designed to advance the national park idea, making it relevant for all Americans for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me turn to our next panelist, uh, Ms. Uh, Gretchen Long, for your comments. Thank you. for the past 30 years. As such, I realize I don't have a title as the rest of my colleagues do, but uh, in that rich experience, I have been chairman of the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. I've been chairman of the National Outdoor Leadership School, Knowles, and many other wonderful organizations. And I did have the privilege of serving on the Second Century Commission as a volunteer conservationist. And it was an extraordinary experience of working with 28 other commissioners from around the country, many of whom did not have, at the beginning of this experience, vast knowledge of the National Park Service. But we came together.
to assess national parks today and what the future holds, and we concluded over a year-long deliberation with an exceptional unity of outlook. That was, I think, part of the amazing transformation that took place among the commissioners. And we felt as a whole, as a body, that not only are our national parks America's best idea, as Wallace Stegner has said, but they are positioned to be a leading force in meeting the 21st century challenges of accelerated loss of nature, public disengagement, and youthful disconnect. The committee that I am particularly representing was the Science and Natural Resources Committee. I served under the able leadership of Dr. Rita Caldwell, who was the chair and the former director of the National Science Foundation and current distinguished professor of the University of Maryland. The committee noted that our national parks, Acadia, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Yellowstone, are among America's favorite icons, and as such have the support of most of the people in the country. They are the translators of America's great outdoors. They are the remaining bastions of biodiversity. But in the 21st century, it is clear that the national parks alone cannot sustain our nation's ecological heritage. National parks are neither fully representative of our natural, national natural systems, nor are national parks isolated islands able to accomplish their mission of keeping resources unimpaired for future generations up against the modern pressures that abound today. The Park Service will need to grow in a manner in which they operate and work within a broader context. The, therefore, the Science and Natural Resources Committee recommends, one, that the President of the United States should establish a task force, including the National Park Service and other federal agencies involved in conservation, along with their state, local, and nonprofit partners, to A, map a national strategy for protecting America's natural heritage, and B, to identify protection of the nation's natural assets as a common goal of all agencies while pursuing their respective agency agendas. Two, national parks impacted by their surroundings cannot endure alone. The Park Service has a long history in reaching out to communities and establishing partnerships, as well as engaging the visitor, <coughs> often being the environmental translator. It sets a high standard in the way it manages its resources. Thus, it is uniquely qualified to offer technical assistance and counsel to a larger public. The committee recommends the creation of new legislation modeled after the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 to enhance protection of national heritage values on non-federal lands. Such legislation would provide leadership opportunities for the Park Service to provide technical ass assistance and counsel and to encourage incentives for private land conservation. It is not intended to convey any new management or regulatory authority. And finally, three, in recent decades, the science arm of the National Park Service has been weakened. To realize its promise, the Park Service must be a trusted scientific authority. The committee advises science must be strengthened within the service to support a science-based foundation for building a 21st century system. The Park Service needs to build an internally directed research program which takes advantage of the data in its venue, and which also makes ecosystem and species restoration a hallmark of its applied science capability. To conclude, our nation's natural assets will only be secure if there is a coordinated, comprehensive, scientifically-based approach to ensuring our natural heritage. And the Park Service, with its outstanding system of parks, is eminently qualified to take a leadership role in this critical endeavor. Thank you for your time. I mean, introduce the Honorable Vic Fazio uh, for his comments, and thank you for being here, sir. Thank you, Chairman Grijalva and uh, Ranking Member Bishop and members of the committee for putting the time in to hear the recommendations of this National Park's Second Century Commission. I want to begin by uh, in telling you what an incredibly capable, 
um, diverse and talented group of people I had the privilege of serving with on this commission. You get a slice of that in the testimony of this panel and uh, later on from uh, uh, additional testimony uh, from the gentleman who sits behind us, Mr. Uh, Jerry Rogers. But it really was an incredibly capable and in involved group of people who came from a variety of different perspectives and found that they had a common interest in the national parks and its further development. Of course, much of our recommendation took the long view. We were not focused just on the next couple of fiscal years. We did look down the road and determined that uh, for the National Park Service to be able to meet the mission that it was envisioned to have by this commission, a good deal more funding would be required. And as a former appropriator here in the Congress, I sat on the committee chaired by Linda Bilmes, who is the professor of public policy at the Kennedy School at Harvard and an experienced budgeteer. And our task was to look at what kind of infusion of new financial resources might be possible, given the very obvious restraints of our current budget environment ongoing in this country for, I'm sure, at least a decade more, if not longer. Our commitment was first and foremost to increasing operational funding. It is absolutely critical to implementing any number of significant recommendations of this panel that we have the adequate operational funding to have the resources, the personnel, and the organizational capacity to meet the Park Service's mission, to serve the public, to diversify the workforce, as we've heard comment today, to conduct scientific research that's so needed in so many areas of the country, and to protect the park resources, which we know are in many places under stress. The National Park Service budget uh, of $2.7 billion is less than one-tenth of one percent of the federal budget. As you've already heard discussion, we have a $600 million shortfall in operating funding. Our backlog for maintenance is $9 billion, and there is nowhere near an amount adequate to deal with the potential acquisition of inholdings from willing sellers. The Commission came to appreciate the role that Congress has played in recent years. Two presidents, as well, have shown a willingness to attack the operational shortfall of the park system. But we believe the Congress must continue that effort and increase funding for the National Park Service by at least $100 million over the next uh, six years beyond the fixed cost of inflation. That would allow us to work down this shortfall in a relatively short period of time. Second, we think the Land and Water Conservation Fund has to be more adequately uh, spent on issues related to the Park Service. As, as you know, less than half that money is now provided to the service. In addition, I think it's most important that we look down the road confronting these fiscal challenges to the creation of an endowment and a national campaign leading up to the centennial in 2016. As uh, Linda Bilmes, our chairman, said, if we intend to protect the national parks in perpetuity, basic finance tells us that we must fund them in perpetuity as well. And so we've talked about an endowment that could provide a perpetual revenue stream an opportunity to enable donors to give or bequeath funds to provide for a range of purposes, including science and scholarship, education, specific park service projects, public-private initiatives outside park boundaries that serve the broader mission, and other philanthropic activity that we believe should supplement, not replace, appropriations. Lastly, we think following along in the initiative of former Secretary Kempthorne, that we need to build a national campaign for this next centennial, the Park Service. We've talked about engaging philanthropists, corporations, citizens from all walks of life, 
but we like to get the average citizen involved directly through maybe the purchase of coins or stamps or other things that would give average people an opportunity to help just as much as those who have the resources in our society. So we're privileged to present these suggestions to you, knowing full well the difficulty of finding adequate funding going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Dennis Galvin, former Deputy Director, National Park Service. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to testify uh, before this committee on the second century of National Parks. Um, as it happens, uh, I have testified before this committee for 25 years, going back to when Chairman Udall was here and all his uh, successors. And I appreciate the vital support that this committee gives to National Parks, both in in, in developing the growth of the system and in, in uh, giving us policy direction for the parks management. We have built the best park system in the world. Each of us played many roles on the Commission. My focus here today is to report our findings on the future shape of the national park system. In passing the Organic Act of August 25, 1916, the Congress directed the National Park Service to adhere to the highest standard of preservation in our system of public institutions to preserve, quote, unimpaired for future generations. Our examination of the current system was characterized by the words cornerstone and keystone. National parks are part of larger systems that exert critical influences on the unimpairment mandate. To make the current and future systems work, they need to be embedded in a national conservation strategy. We recommended this and were heartened at the recent White House Conference on Americans Outdoors. Several commissioners were among the invitees. We look forward to the conferee's continuing work. And there is an urgency to this task. More than one million acres of open space are developed each year in this country. Based on that rate, we are erasing a Yellowstone every two years. By contrast, the national park system has grown by less than 100,000 acres in the last decade. We believe there is room for robust growth. National parks comprise less than 4% of the U.S., less than 2% of the lower 48. In our commission meetings, we heard support for growth. Future growth needs to be guided by a plan. The current system has many gaps. It tends toward high elevation and thin soils. It is not the system one would design to preserve biodiversity. Existing parks can be expanded. Fresh water and marine areas and grasslands are poorly represented. Cultural additions should fill out the nation's story with, addition, with attention to gender, race, and diversity. However, even a strategically growing park system must be considered part of the larger landscape. We endorse heritage areas and cooperative approaches. Citizens ask for help in restoring degraded areas. We propose ecological restoration areas. We envision an NPS that is more than a land manager. It is a convener and catalyst, a growing organization. Our larger vision is a system that works for all, past, present, and future, a system that supports, quote, a citizenry using its heritage to build a better nation, end quote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for your, your comments. Uh, Dr. Lockhart, uh, one, your testimony, in the testimony you indicated that Congress and uh, MPS need to do more to establish education as a fundamental purpose of our park system. Yes. Uh, Talk a little bit about that, and why is it clear now that we should be doing that? Well, I think the thing that we wanted to emphasize is that it, we feel that it's a core element going forward to both educate for the sake of education and enhancing our nation's educational agenda, but also as a way to engage uh, young people in diverse communities. I think we heard uh, in Director Jarvis's testimony and the subsequent questions that, um, that there's a need to establish a, a pipeline that will help engage diverse communities, that will help invite them to participate in uh, the workforce and diversifying the workforce of the National Park Service. 
and to explicitly state that education is a part of this strategic objective for the next 100 years we feel is important because, um, at least in our opinion, it has not always been something that the Park Service has placed at the highest of its priorities. And there are times at which education has been something that has, shall we say, been less than the top of the list of things to either achieve or to fund. Ms. Long, uh, your testimony suggests that a, a potential new program modeled after the Historic Preservation Act would al to allow uh, National Park Service uh, to work on natural resource protection on non-federal lands. Uh, if you could expand on the idea and, and the corresponding pitfalls that will occur well, we and the reaction very, you'll get. Yeah, thank you. We were much impressed on the commission of the success thus far of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 in that it's a mechanism by which the Park Service can reach out to communities and uh, offer um, advice, uh, counsel, um, knowledge, um, a, a leadership role in engaging the public outside of park boundaries uh, in accomplishing historic preservation goals. Uh, they also uh, involves incentives, such as in the case of natural heritage, private land, conservation incentives. And we felt it was a model that could be applied uh, effectively and well uh, for the natural ecological goals as it has for the cultural and historic goals. So we feel it's something that can be developed far further in enriching the Park Service's leadership and uh, collaborative role with communities. Thank you. Uh, con uh, Congressman, how would the, the private en endowment uh, work? Uh, well, you'll get the reaction that it's privatizing our national parks. Uh, how would you? How would that solve the persistent problems in the appropriations process? That you know that the big parks get the big bucks, and so just to. We believe there are an awful lot of Americans of all income levels who support the parks and want to see them enhanced and better utilized. It seems to us that if the president were to appoint a commission to look at how an endowment could be formed, could be created, that would be a good first step. And we'd like to tie it into this re-emphasis of the parks. You know, this is the period of staycations. People aren't uh, traveling as much as they might in the past. Parks are getting a good deal more utilization in the areas in which they're located. Uh, I think there is opportunities to reawaken the public to the park's needs, and we think there will be ways through an endowment to not only enhance the educational programs, the scientific programs we've just discussed, but frankly to look in terms of, of funding for enhancements to existing parks, or in some cases where there's local support, increasing uh, the utilization of parks and developing new ones. So often the money has been provided for these kinds of single purpose local purposes, but we think there's some additional uh, agenda items that really transcend any one individual park that other elements of the community would like to contribute to through an endowment as well. It's not the sole answer. We continue to see appropriations as vital, as I said, but we also know that given the limits that we're going to be living under, we do have to tap the private sector and we think there's resources there to be tapped. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, that supplemental support is important. It can't supplant what we should be doing. We don't regardless. want to zero some game, Mr. Yeah. And, and how would, I guess that would be part of the commission uh, directive as well. How do you uh, assure that uh, MPS is making the decisions regarding how to utilize endowment funds as opposed to uh, the, pri the donor? I think that's, that's a very pertinent question that would need to be addressed by this commission, just what the role of the Park Service is, including the Department of Interior in general, and the 
effort that would be put forth to bring in the resources. Some of them would be very targeted and some of them would be for general purposes, I'm sure. But all of them need to be coordinated with the Park Service. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I've got over my time, but I'm gonna ask Mr. Galvin a question so we don't, I don't have to come back through and extend that courtesy to my colleagues as well. Uh, Mr. Galvin, you, you've given decades of service, as, as you mentioned, to the national parks. Uh, you've seen all these transitions that we've gone through as a system. Uh, if you had to pick, uh, what would you identify as the three, four, five most important things Congress could do uh, to further the goals uh, that are part of this report? Well, I guess my, my response would be to say that we're all in this together, that parks have become islands in a much larger uh, sea of influence, so to speak. Uh, the, Director Jarvis uh, mentioned the potential uh, for this oil spill that occurs really quite far out in the Gulf of Mexico to affect uh, a dozen national parks. And I think that's a metaphor for our current situations. So what, what we need to do, what we as a people and we as a Congress need to do is to figure out what it is we want to save, not necessarily what we want to put in national parks. Some of it should go in national parks, but there are places, heritage areas being an example, where locals can identify things that we want to save and then manage that towards the future. Consistency is one of the words. It's, it's not anti-development, it's smart development. It's smart growth. So that, so that I, I remember a former superintendent of Yellowstone uh, years ago um, standing up in a management meeting and saying, you know, when we started our career, and he was a little bit before my generation, he said, we thought Yellowstone was big enough. He said, now we know no park is big enough. And it seems to me solving that problem collectively, all of us, uh, is the biggest problem facing the national park system. And if we solve it, I think we strengthen the country. Not just strengthen the national park system, but strengthen the country. Thank you. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I appreciate the guests here. I'm going to ask each of you just to fill in the sentence. And it, it comes part because I think that some of the goals were convoluted. The most important purpose of a national park is you get to use one dependent phrase, no clauses, and it can't be a compound sentence. So while you're thinking of that one, uh, I do appreciate the testimony. You've given some very cogent remarks. None of the platitudes that I saw in the actual report. That's very good. Ms. Long, next time you write the report. And Congressman Fazio, as a former appropriator, so you're responsible. All right, let me go down. We'll start with, uh, is it Dr. Lockhead? Lockhart. Dr. Lockhart, yes. Okay. Fill in the sentence. Would you mind repeating the first part, please, <laughs> so I can make it a complete sentence? <laughs> I feel like I'm on the match game again. All right, the most important, the most important uh, purpose of a, national, of, the national, of a national park is? To educate and engage citizens in order to further understand our cultural, historic, and natural and shared natural heritage, national heritage. Okay, you got the one phrase in there, and that's nice. All right, Ms. Long? To conserve our nation's heritage in perpetuity. Congressman? To observe the nation's natural resources and historic sites for the benefit of future generations. Okay, sir? To preserve the resources therein unimpaired <laughs> for our future. <laughs> has a certain <laughs> ring to it. Um, no plagiarism. I, I, I appreciate that. As we look at this entire process, um, one of the things that um, was interesting that was not part of any of the sentences was about the use of it and the purpose of individuals using the process. But that's something we can talk about in the future, and I think those are actually very good sentences. I appreciate you helping out with that. Thank you so much. Yield back. Thank you. Dr. Christians? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of our witnesses for being here today. 
Dr. Lockhart, um, would you expand on the connection between summer jobs on public lands and the pursuit of careers in resource management? Your testimony proposes a pipeline or ladder of learning. Can you expand on those ideas and perhaps explain what barriers may exist to establishing such a system? And as a physician, I'm sure you're very acutely aware of the same pipeline problems we have in developing our diverse healthcare workforce. Correct. Thank you very much for the question, actually. It's obviously something I'm very passionate about on a number of levels. Um, I think that the real barriers start from the fact that one needs, as I was mentioning the example of the park superintendents, it's really about engaging people when they're in their formative years. It's the when you're figuring out what do I want to be, what do I want to do, and then who do I see who looks like me, who do I see, you know, who, uh, how, why is this something that I should aspire to when I'm not getting the feedback that this is something that um, is common in my community. And I, I would say from personal experience, it's, I, can, I can say that going through a number of national parks, there are not a lot of um, people like me that, that you see there, uh, or maybe Latinos or Asians or, or, or other um, members of our diverse communities. So I think that what we were intending to, to imply with these ladders of opportunity are there are many, many different programs many, many different ways, but we need to start with children when they're young. I personally believe that um, at using the school system and using the educational system as a way to engage these children, for example, the, the, uh, the children we talked about in Santa Monica were uh, primarily Latino children who had not been to the, the, the ocean, had not seen the ocean, had not seen Santa Monica Mountains. They went, and then they start to bring their families. Um, and then when there are service opportunities, they can come when they're young teens and work in the parks and do trail restoration and other things and come to learn to love these places. And then there is the opportunity at that point to interact with other rangers and other staff and say, you know, maybe this is something I'd like to do. And there are actually programs that can be replicated um, throughout the national parks to engage uh, folks like this. And I think that, that that is really the model. And that's why partnerships are also so important for the National Park Service, because this is not something that the Park Service can do alone. It's yeah. really a community obligation. Thank you. And, and we do have a summer program for not the younger kids, but for high school kids at home in St. Croix. And it's amazing the difference it has made when the, when the young people come in and don't know anything about the parks, don't want to do this or do some of the, the tasks, but at the end they, they really love it. If I might add just one other footnote, just briefly, um, there is also um, an inspirational ranger, uh, a woman named Betty Reed Soskin, whom I don't know if you're aware. She's 87-year-old African-American ranger at um, Rosie the River uh, National Monument, and she was a Rosie herself. Um, and so she has actually created YouTube videos. We talked about technology, okay. about this, uh, about her experiences, and about what it was like to be a black woman in that environment, where the you know it was obviously very different than what we think of as the typically Caucasian Rosie the Riveter image. And uh, at any rate, the point is that's a use of the technology to kind of educate and engage. So when those children come out, they see and hear those stories, which then engage them and want them to move forward. So. Thank you. <laughs> Congressman Fazio, um, we, we have a National Park Foundation. And uh, did the commission discuss the foundation? And can that serve in the capacity of doing what the endowment would do or is it do you see it as being different? I think we have to be very careful that we don't interfere with uh, the ongoing purpose of that organization, that commission. But I do think that's again the sort of thing that can be looked at by this presidential commission that will try to integrate or separate if that's required the roles that each would have going forward. Uh, we do need to bring a lot more resources to the table we have a broader concept of where those resources could be spent mm -hmm. and isn't all site specific, although that's important and will be ongoing. So uh, I think this needs to be looked at very carefully as we try to proceed to a national campaign and the endowment. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Galvin, um, you talk in your testimony uh, primary recommendation that the future growth of the system be guided by a strategic vision or plan. And there have been, since 1980, there have been many, many 
major studies on where the park is, where it should be going, major conferences. Um, is there not that kind of a plan in place already? And, or are you recommending that we're, we update it? Or, um, a, a little of both. Uh, we looked, uh, in fact, read the previous national park system plans. Um, and we would, and, and they come to some conclusions that, uh, frankly, we endorse. I mean, if you look at the previous natural history plan, it indicates that there's uh, not much in the way of conservation lands in the middle part of the country, the Mississippi Valley, et cetera. And, and, and I think we, we came to the same conclusion. I think I'd go back to the remarks that were made by, uh, by the uh, uh, Congresswoman from Wyoming in that uh, any strategic vision uh, or plan um, has to be uh, vetted uh, in, in the grassroots. I, it's, this is not entirely a scientific or technical task. It is, it is identifying gaps. It is saying, um, for instance, uh, nobody's protecting short grass prairie or nobody's protecting or inadequate protection of long grass prairie. It's not identifying a place on the map. After that, it's, it's trying to find out if there's public support for such protection and whether or not that support indicates it ought to be a national park versus a national wildlife refuge or something like that. It's a, it, it's, it's a comprehensive system based on a national conservation strategy that suggests future growth for the national park system without being prescriptive. And obviously those remarks apply on the cultural resources side. I mean, many of the parks that have been created recently uh, it, un, under Chairman Grijalva is, are, are parks that we would not have imagined creating 20 years ago. Some commemorating events uh, that uh, Hart Mountain was mentioned, uh, that, the, that the country um, would never have considered adding to the national park system. So we see a need for strategic direction, but we also see a need for grassroots support in developing this vision. Mr. Lujan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, a question to, to everyone here today. Um, as the uh, commission was deliberating, um, taking into consideration that each park across the country uh, is unique, um, that we all have special places um, that we want to make sure that we're providing protection to, access to, um, but the importance of taking into consideration um, specifically with this question, Native American and Hispanic communities. So what are your thoughts of preserving access for traditional uses to our beautiful land, sustaining heritage, and protecting cultural uh, practices? Um, but I respect very much the responses to our, our ranking member um, and the inclusion of the recommendations with cultural connectivity, lifelong learning, history, community assistance, and uh, any, any thoughts uh, in that area? I might make a comment uh, briefly about just an observation of an example uh, in which the National Park Service can play a real role uh, in engaging <clears throat> with cultural restoration in a Native American community, for example, up in Olympic National Park with the Elwha River Dam Removal Project, which is an example of where um, it's a combination of working closely with the local Elwha, Lower Elwha Clallam tribe there. Um, it obviously restores the um, natural resources, the natural flow of the Elwha River. It also restores the salmon that the uh, Elwha Clallam tribe uh, has historically uh, had and is, considers their birthplace. And it creates an opportunity for not just that tribe, but also for that community to learn more and be educated more about that culture and to understand and preserve that, that culture. So it's actually bringing back the culture, it's educating the community, and it's establishing a link between um, the Park Service, it's preserving for future generations, and it's achieving all those things by really honoring and respecting um, the native practices that once existed and bringing them back. So it's an opportunity to achieve all of those things. And I think it's a wonderful example of how the Park Service as an institution can play a role in making that happen in, in communities. 
Anyone else? I would only ask, uh, offer the, to look to Alaska uh, and the way in which the Park Service uh, works cooperatively with indigenous populations and the um, preserving of traditional usages is an example of, of approaches that might be appropriately used more broadly. Alaska has been quite successful in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another question to uh, get some response to is we have places in New Mexico like the Valles Caldera which has fallen into um, different situations as we're trying to preserve that area as well. Um, what are your thoughts along that line as well with maybe the inclusion of the Valles Caldera into the park system while at the same time recognizing that when the, when the Valles was turned over into uh, the preserve that we have today, that there was grazing that was taking place. It was said to be turned over in pristine condition where there was uh, uh, working with the community, access to hunting and fishing, um, wood gathering to help with um, keeping uh, this beautiful place healthy as well. Uh, Dennis, any, any thoughts along those lines? Uh, yeah, Mr. Lujan, I had the great pleasure of living in New Mexico uh, in the late 60s uh, and uh, know both Bandelera and Valles Caldera very well. Um, I'd go back to answer your earlier question in this context, and that is that as Congress has created new units of the national park system, it has usually responded uh, with uh, recognition of local conditions. Uh, a, a good example in the, in, the context, in the context of your earlier question is Canyon de Chez, which became a national uh, park unit in the 1930s, but in which the Park Service owns no land. The Navajo tribe owns the land, and the, and the National Park Service was given the mission of interpreting uh, and running educational programs there at the sufferance of the Navajo tribe, I might say. So that, so that with respect to bringing uh, Valle Grande into the national park system, which uh, personally, since I'm not speaking as an administration witness, I think is a great idea. But I think it needs, to, the legislation needs to be crafted to recognize the kind of local values that you're talking about. And I think that I think it would be a great addition to the national park system, and I think that can be done uh, using uh, input from the local people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, thank uh, this panel. It was excellent. Appreciate it very much. And uh, invite the next panel up, and thank you again. much and uh, let me uh, thank the panel for your uh, time and uh, your patience and we're looking forward to your comments and uh, first let me uh, ask our my good friend uh, gentleman from New Mexico Mr. Lujan to uh, introduce uh, our first uh, panelist sir. Mr. Chairman thank you very much and today I have the great pleasure of introducing two of my constituents Jerry Rogers formerly of the National Park Service and Armand Ortega of Ortega's Enterprises. Mr. Jerry Rogers has been a vital coordinator of the National Park System community for over four decades, serving in an official capacity as Associate Director for Cultural Resources and Keeper of the National Register of Historic Places. Mr. Rogers played a crucial role in the shaping of the National Park Service. He was appointed Conference Chair of Discovery 2000, the National Park Service General Conference, in which he worked to envision and lay the foundation for the future of the national parks in our nation. In addition to his capacity as a leader with the NPS, after retirement he continued to serve New Mexico's national parks as a board member and president of the New Mexico Heritage Preservation Alliance. His work preserving our cultural assets while making the natural beauty of New Mexico more accessible for our community displays his deep understanding of both the national and local importance of our national parks. His unique national and local background makes his contribution to this hearing invaluable. Alternatively, Mr. Armand Ortega has been a concessions vendor at the National Parks since the early 1990s. As an eco-friendly vendor, Mr. Ortega has seen his business grow exponentially as he serves four national parks that include Bandelier Trading Company, Carlsbad Caverns Trading Company, White Sands Trading Company in New Mexico, and Muir Woods Trading Company in Northern California. Serving visitors to large parks and small monuments, 
Mr. Ortega Small Business has grown into an expansive, expansive company that employs and serves thousands every year. As the National Parks enter their second century, small businesses will play a critical role in the experience of future visitors. Mr. Chairman, it's an honor to uh, welcome Mr. Rogers and Mr. Ortega, two outstanding New Mexicans, and I look forward to their testimony. Thank you. Let me uh, begin with uh, our first witness, Mr. Ortega, Ortega Family Enterprises. And uh, by way of a thank you, thank you for your hospitality with, at Muir when we were there to visit. Very much appreciated. And it was a very good trip for us, and we appreciate it in, 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 no, in no small part due to your hospitality. We appreciate it. Your comments, Mr. Ortega. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Lujan, for that wonderful introduction. I, I couldn't have said it better. Um, I want to talk about three specific things uh, that we have done. Not, I, I understand we need to do a lot in this next century. But we came in as small concessionaires, and we bid against very, very large, multi-billion dollar concessionaires. We have managed to increase the attendance at all our parks. Moreover, we've managed to increase the revenues at all, number two, the revenues at all the parks. And three, we have done that by main, maintaining very good relations with uh, the NPS. Now, uh, in spite of that, I want to point out, as, as wonderful as the second century report was, I, am, I, think the only, I think I'm the only representative up here of, uh, the, uh, of the concessions. And if you look at the report, I found the word concessions one time. Now, I understand they were they had bigger fish to fry. But let me just give you one statistic. There are 21,000 employees of the national parks working in the national parks. There are 26,000 employees from the concessions. Almost all 26,000 of those interface with all of the visitors every day and almost all of the park employees. I'll tell you a little bit about the stores that we do have. We have Bandelier. The reason we won Bandelier probably was because we showed the national parks how we could take the sale of Indian arts and crafts, Native American wares, from 10% to 60%. In White Sands, the reason we won was because uh, we also showed them how they could raise Indian arts and crafts, but also we offered to renovate a historically valuable building. The parks did not have the money, so we donated the money. Now, that was not necessarily out of the goodness of, of my heart or the corporation. We understood that over the period of time, we could make that money back, and, and we have. We uh, remodeled the whole thing, took down the, the Vegas, the Mantias, redid it, did the old style Spanish floor. It was a lot of fun, a lot of work, but it's pretty nice. At Carlsbad, we showed the parks how we could save the ecosystem downstairs. Fortunately, I have a daughter-in-law who did her, her graduate work in science, chemistry at, at Stanford, and she knew a lot about that. Oh, by the way, we bid at a, at a kitchen table, and we are bidding against uh, companies that have uh, rows and rows of, of, of riders. Uh, but we are very, very motivated. Anyway, to Muir Woods, very quickly. Uh, we at, oh, by the way, at all these parks, we brought in, uh, we have managed to bring in an increase, not just intendant, attendance, and not just uh, the revenues, where we're paying literally 250 to 300 percent more than the previous concessionaire, but we've managed to bring in minorities and younger people. And they're very, very simple ways. I know there are other esoteric ways, and I read about them, and I respect those in, in, in the report, but they're very simple ways to bring in uh, minorities, very simple way to bring in people, and I'd like to talk about that. I don't think I'm going to have quite the time. The other thing we're really happy with, uh, with Mir Woods, is that we created a totally, or almost totally, food sustainable uh, restaurant operation. Almost all of our food is sourced within a 30 to 35, about 90% is sourced within a 30 to 35 uh, mile radius. Um, almost everything is, is recyclable. The, the, uh, uh, it's all natural, hormone free, all of that stuff. And we've won, <clears throat> and I apologize, I don't know the names of all the considerable environmental and green awards we've won, but my son, who's really heading it up, has told me about them, and, and, and trust me, there, there are a bunch. We're going to be on the Food Channel next month. Uh, I don't watch the Food Channel much. I just eat food, but um, we're going to be on it on a show called The Best Thing I Ever Ate. The Los Angeles Times has covered us, the New York Times. 
um, the Wall Street Journal and the San Francisco Chronicle and other papers. So we're getting a lot of publicity, and that's free to the parks. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is in, in, in reading uh, the Second Commission report, um, there is one other, I'd like to gently suggest there's one other uh, area where maybe people should think about a little bit. Everything they said, or a lot of things they said, I don't agree with everything, is really good. But there is already a prototype, and I mentioned it. Uh, there was a guy named Brian O'Neill in San Francisco, brilliant guy, he just passed away. I fortunately uh, got to meet him uh, about a year ago, and he created the Golden Gate Conservancy. The great thing about Brian was he didn't think just in terms, I hate to use the term, but he thought out of the box. He thought about how best to serve the parks. So if he could work, if he could work with an entrepreneur, he'd do that. If he could do a traditional national park contract, he'd do that. They were doing a $150 million hotel. You can't do it on a 10 or 20 year term like the national parks do. You can't amortize that generally, and certainly in this case, uh, over that short a period of time. So he found a way to do a conventional commercial lease. He worked with nonprofits. He set up a uh, park investment fund. By the way, these park investment funds might be really useful, especially for the smaller entrepreneurs such as myself. Uh, I don't mean to brag, but I think we're one of the best operations in the parks. If I could get the money that some of these largers had, I could compete with them and uh, perhaps give them a run for their money and raise the bar for everybody. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, excuse me. Ruth Pierpont, President, National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Chairman Grijalva and Ranking Member Bishop for the opportunity to testify before you today. Um, I am President of the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers and also the Director of the Division for Historic Preservation of the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation. State Historic Preservation Officers and countless historic preservation advocates are elated to see this report contain such a strong historic preservation component. As the report states, quote, our nation is best armed to address the future with the public knowledgeable about its history, the resources, and the responsibilities of citizenship. The conservation of our nation's historic and nat natural resources occurs along a continuum. At one end, conservation occurs through the National Park Service's ownership of our national parks. At the other end, the NPS accomplishes conservation of non-federally owned historic sites through the state and tribal historic preservation offices, here and after referred to as SHPOs and TIPOs. The nation's historic resources are best served when the federal government supports all components of the continuum. No nation has the resources to buy and maintain property in perpetuity, um, and maintain in perpetuity every historic place. However, America's conservation continuum allows us to preserve or consider preservation of every historic place. The Second Century Report, report recommends, and SHPO's wholeheartedly agree, that the Historic Preservation Fund must have permanent and guaranteed funding at its authorized level of $150 million for the program to flourish and be executed as the original writers intended nearly a half century ago. Like the LWCF, HPF income derives from offshore oil lease revenues. Effectively using non-renewable, one non-renewable resource to preserve others, our nation's natural and historic resources, which benefit all Americans, enriching parks, open space, and our human habitat, those neighborhoods and main streets where we live, work, and play. A fully funded HPF would impact numerous report recommendations but I'd like to take just a few moments to highlight three. First, regarding the recommendation for increased access to historic preservation assistance, tools, and incentives by residents of high poverty areas across the country. All American experiences are far from the same, but they are all significant and necessary to tell America's complete story. When provided the means, SHPOs have the infrastructure in place to assist all communities and ensure that America's complete story can be told forever. 
I ask you how disappointing and misleading would it be if future archaeologists came to study 20th century America and found evidence of only large civic structures and commercial buildings and residences from a few elite communities. By not fully funding the HPF, we are condemning future generations to American history memory loss. Second, regarding the recommendation to enhance funding for and make full use of community assistance <coughs> programs. The federal-state partnership created through the Historic Preservation Program was designed to engage communities and that engagement is formalized in over 1,700 municipalities through the Certified Local Government Program. Fully funding the HPF will allow SHPOs to meet the preservation needs of communities everywhere by providing financial and technical assistance for Main Street rehabilitation programs which support local economic development, neighborhood rehabilitation and historic home energy conservation assistance, educational programs for communities and homeowners, and recognition of local historic places through National Register nominations and publications supporting cultural tourism. Other NPS external programs that work with communities such as American Battlefields Protection, Save America's Treasures, Preserve America, and Teaching with Historic Places also complement this effort. And finally, regarding the recommendation to identify bold and achievable goals for preserving our nation's historic resources, Mr. Chairman, I challenge you and the NPS to think outside the box and to support the entire conservation continuum by fully funding the HPF. In doing so, you will affirm the original intent of the National Historic Preservation Act and will also recognize that historic preservation can and should be a goal of our nation's sustainability, livability, and great outdoors agendas. Historic preservation is one of the best tools to preserve a neighborhood's livability and sustainability by using existing infrastructure that provides a sense of place and by leveraging that authenticity for new investment, tourism, and smart growth. By setting bold new goals for preserving our nation's re historic resources, we will invest in the health, knowledge, and quality of our nation's future. In conclusion, as the NPS enters its second century, please remember that for nearly half a century, SHPOs and TIPOs have been saving America's history and producing results that benefit all America's citizens and communities. The combination of federal leadership and state execution works. Today, with America's natural and built environment being threatened, it is time for Congress to reaffirm this partnership that has worked so well. It is time to give the states, states and tribes the funding and tools to do the job that the National Historic Preservation Act's visionary framers intended. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Ruth Reif, Association of Na National Park Rangers, thank you for being here. Look forward to your comments. Chairman Grijalva and members of the subcommittee, I am Holly Reif, a National Park Service employee for 17 years. <coughs> and currently the Chief Ranger at Catoctin Mountain Park in Maryland. Today, though, I am appearing on my own time and expense in my capacity as a member of the Association of National Park Rangers, and I'm pleased to present this testimony on behalf of AMPR. I thank you for holding this hearing on the future of the National Park Service and the National Park System. The Association of National Park Rangers is a nonprofit organization founded in 1977 and today has about 1,200 members that incur, include current, former, and aspiring employees of the National Park Service. We advocate for all employees of the National Park Service, regardless of their job title, and for the overall health of the National Park Service and the system. Last year in Knoxville, Tennessee, MPS Director John Jarvis spoke about the National Park's Second Century Commission Report comparing it to other well-written NPS reports in recent decades. Director Jar Jarvis elaborated this thought by explaining, we don't necessarily need another report, we need to take action. We agree. Subcommittee members may be asking themselves, how does the NPS move from just another report to desired results and outcomes? If your choice is legislation, we recommend legislation that it contains accountability measures that attach to appropriations at park level and individual employees' annual performance appraisals. 
With regard to MPS workforce recruitment, we recommend greater emphasis in these areas. Simplify the application and hiring processes and utilize hiring authorities that move the best college students in the proper fields of study into the MPS workforce. Establish close relationships with universities and colleges with weekly communications to recruit for MPS career opportunities. With regards to MPS workforce recruitment and diversity, we believe that AMPR could be of assistance to the MPS under a cooperative agreement with the right set of conditions. This would be through AMPR's college chapter program. We think targeting minority university and colleges with a sustained MPS or affiliated presence is the way to go here. We believe that for a better MPS future, time and energy must be invested into building the careers of students and seasonal employees who are the workforce of tomorrow. We cannot emphasize enough that getting hired into an MPS job often requires more than education and technical skills. It also requires an understanding of MPS application procedures and preparation techniques and an understanding of how to navigate the MPS agency culture to include competitiveness and opportunities for networking within the culture. In the area of training, MP AMPR supports the current Superintendents Academy with modification and the MPS Fundamentals Training Program to help new employees understand the agency's culture. We agree that MPS should invest 4% of its personnel budget to employ professional development. This amount should be fairly divided among each park's employees based on ability and desire, and each park's travel ceiling should be adjusted so as not to exclude this amount. We believe we can be of the most assistance to Congress and the MPS in increasing the diversity of applicants for MPS positions through our college chapters program and by surveying MPS employees to ascertain what types of MPS tra provided training and professional development opportunities they view as lacking. Our members represent over 10,000 years of experience in operating and managing units of the National Park System. For many of us, the National Park idea is the central theme, not only in our professional lives, but in many cases, our families' lives and values, our sense of patriotism, and our very definition of what being an American is. We pledge to assist this subcommittee and the National Park Service in whatever ways we can to assure that the National Park idea remains relevant and accessible to our citizens today and for the more, many more yet to be born. On behalf of the Association of National Park Rangers, I thank you for this opportunity to present this testimony, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Jerry Rogers, former, former Associate Director for Cultural Resources, National Park Service. Welcome, sir. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Bishop, I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to appear today as chair of the Cultural Resource and Historic Preservation Committee of the National Parks Second Century Commission, and also as a representative of the Coalition of National Park Service Retirees. Working among the diverse and creative minds of the commission members was a wonderful capstone to a career. Working as one of 800 members of the coalition, the voices of experience who speak from unique perspectives on behalf of the parks and the service, reinforces the fact that it was more a calling than a career. Experience teaches one to think strategically, to draw upon history, to analyze the present, and to look as far as possible into the future. That is why the coalition members were among the first to advocate using the National Park Service Centennial for a long and thoughtful look into the second century of this special calling. That is why the coalition supports everything in the commission report advancing the national park idea and in the reports of the commission's eight committees. My formal statement submitted for the record touches upon only a few of the recommendations dealing with demographic change, education, employee development, and international activities, but we endorse them all. At the core of the commission's work are three fundamentals. 
One, the national parks and the historic and natural places preserved by others using National Park Service programs are America, the core of how Americans know ourselves as a people. Two, the national parks cannot be preserved by acting only inside the parks. And three, the grassroots approaches of the service's cultural resource and historic preservation programs provide guidance on for how the parks can be preserved. Historic preservation is more nearly a citizen movement than a government program. It begins with owners of historic places who feel the privilege of stewardship and with neighbors who live near the places and love them. Seeking advice and help, and sometimes strength and support, these good citizens make use of nonprofit organizations and of their local governments. Countless nonprofits and more than 1,700 certified local governments are part of the movement. For further help, they then turn to state historic preservation officers who are appointed by their governors and who run programs tailored to the histories and realities of their individual states. Most of the 80,000 listings in the National Register of Historic Places got there through nominations initiated by local people and formalized by state historic preservation officers. Almost 90 American Indian tribes and virtually all land managing federal agencies are part of this bottom-up process that works on behalf of the national park idea inside parks and beyond park boundaries. The National Park Service is directed by law to provide leadership to this network. A good way to do that would be to fund the full $150 million per annum from the Historic Preservation Fund to enable and to support this network that in turn supports the parks. The service of the future can better protect the natural and other aspects of its parks by developing natural resource-oriented programs counterpart to the historic preservation programs, perhaps assisted with stateside land and water conservation fund support. There is, unfortunately, an urgent problem in the cultural resource and historic preservation programs that requires remediation before those programs can return to their visionary potential. They have suffered in recent years from repression rather than inspiration. They've undergone budget and staff reductions of 25% or more, and at present they are without a senior executive level head. Recruitment of an associate director for cultural resources needs to be completed as quickly as possible, and the service needs to support that action with a cultural resource challenge budget and professional staffing initiative counterpart to the successful natural resource challenge of recent years. Only then can the service return to its tradition of leadership in the cultural resource and historic preservation fields. We thank the subcommittee for holding this hearing and we hope this hearing will only be the beginning of a national conversation in the Congress and throughout the country on the value of parks and park service programs and on how to carry out a century of success into a second century. Whatever else we do, let's create and maintain a focus on vision. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Raymond Warner, uh, United Nations Foundation. Welcome, sir. Look forward to your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I am not a specialist in the national park system or in conservation, but over the past 30 years, I have worked closely with the Park Service in its international outreach. First, as the State Department officer responsible for preparing delegations to meetings of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee, and since retirement, on behalf of the United Nations Foundation on shared priorities such as biodiversity protection. But this morning I speak for myself alone and on the basis of this long experience, I wish to share with you my firm conviction that to the degree the international outreach of the National Park Service can be strengthened and expanded, to that degree the national interest and the global good will be served. I say this not only because of the unparalleled expertise of the Park Service in conservation, 
but also because of the indispensable credibility it brings to the State Department in negotiating politically sensitive issues of heritage protection in Jerusalem, Kosovo, and the Thai-Cambodian border when they arise at meetings of the World Heritage Com Committee. The Park Service has for many years done the heavy lifting in preparing and leading our government's participation in the World Heritage Convention, which over the years has identified nearly 800 sites worldwide deemed to be of outstanding universal value. States' parties to the convention take it seriously, as does the international conservation community. A measure of this seriousness is that the annual committee meeting of just 21 members usually draws eight to 900 delegates, even when in recent years it meets in such distant locations as Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand. Permit me to observe that while there is usually background noise during meetings of this size, a hush falls when the National Park Service is at the microphone, because everyone knows that the Park Service will speak knowledgeably and credibly about the conservation and preservation of these sites, and how local communities can on the one hand help in their conservation, and on the other benefit from the economic dividends they can provide. For many years, the Park Service, under both Republican and Democratic administrations, has given professional credibility to the U.S. delegations at these meetings. There are likely many reasons for this international respect for the Park Service and through it for the United States. But in large measure, it appears to be a return on sound investments made by the U.S. government in international programs such as the Park Service Peace Corps Partnership in 1972 that grew into the largest volunteer conservation program in the world. The Park Service's international seminar on the administration of national parks had comparable success and continues to bring long-term benefits to the United States of goodwill and enhanced technical expertise. This program had at one time trained the majority of national park executives worldwide. It put the U.S. and the National Park Service on the map as the key conservation player internationally. And very importantly, served to introduce hundreds of innovative ideas and concepts to the National Park Service management. It is noteworthy that the current Deputy Director of the World Heritage Center is a seminar graduate, and its director is a former Fulbright Fellow. This is one reason that the United States has significant policy influence at the center. Regrettably, funding for the international seminar eroded and like the National Park Service Peace Corps Agreement, it was discontinued. But fortunately, good things continue to happen. The National Park Service recently initiated the World Heritage Fellows Program. It offers training opportunities to qualified candidates who wish to learn from the U.S. experience in managing and protecting World Heritage sites. The fellows work alongside National Park Service professionals in a variety of areas. Travel expenses are paid by the Park Service's international office, while international or individual parks provide housing. Mr. Chairman, as we celebrate the beginning of the park system's second century, it is increasingly clear that the forces that shape our future are becoming increasingly global in nature. I respectfully suggest, consequently, that it is time to provide the National Park Service with the means to renew and expand its international outreach. In particular, to renew its partnership with the Peace Corps and to relaunch the International Seminar on the Administration of National Parks, as well as assignments of specialists to regional park and wildlife training centers in developing nations. I recommend also that the committee consider support for emerging new programs such as Global Parks, which working with the Park Service has the potential to mobilize retired conservation specialists
for service abroad. These are the kinds of things our government does very well. And as the record shows, they are investments that bring a high return. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, let me begin. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ortega, you, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that uh, when you took over the concession at White Sands, you, you, had, you made some much needed uh, renovations to the concession, concession space, and then afterwards uh, you, you gave those improvements to, to the park. Correct. Following up on that, let me just talk a little bit about, do you have any thoughts of dealing with the, the problem that I per perceive in, in the parks where a leasehold uh, surrender interest, basically the, the existing operator's capital investment is, is almost, it's a prohibition almost uh, from competing concessionaires in the bidding process. <laughs> and uh, so that's really the point. That your reaction to that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, what you say is absolutely true. Uh, the, the LSI and the, P, uh, the PI before that are almost uh, imaginary concepts now that don't have anything to do with reality. And there are a lot of situations, not so much in, in, in my parks except for one, but particularly with the, the bigger concessionaires. We have a situation at the Grand Canyon where the LSI is now <clears throat> excuse me, at something like, as I understand it, and I'm not at all an expert in this area, uh, something like 250 million, okay? Uh, the return, they do about 70, 75 million a year there, and they're making somewhere between seven and eight million as, I don't have, I'm not privy to the okay. books, but I'm just using rule of thumb. There's no way that you can get uh, anybody to bid and pay, uh, if I had the 250 million, which I don't, I would not bid on the Grand Canyon precisely for this reason. I don't know, as an aside, where they got these numbers. I suspect uh, there was a little pushing by some of the concessions, uh, to tell the truth here, long ago when it was PI and uh, uh, to inflate those numbers. At any rate, uh, that is what you say is definitely a problem. Um, and I can put a, a question back to, to, to everyone here. What if uh, the concessionaire there looks at the numbers and realizes this isn't worth $250 million, and they leave? Isn't the government supposed to pay them that $250 million? I think so. Now, as I say, this is not in my area, and, and so I just hear around the edges what this is about. My son could probably better address this, but he's obviously not here. So th that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rogers, I, I, uh, just a general idea, if you could, of the types of uh, cultural and historic un units that, that are lacking in the current system as you've gone through this process. Mr. Chairman, the um the uh, Cultural Resource and Historic Preservation Committee gave attention to this during the process of the commission. Um, I, I would say some of the more uh, obvious uh, examples are the ones alluded to by uh, uh, Representative Lujan. I would say American Indian history for one example. American Indian history that doesn't have to reach back to antiquity into ancient times nor the history that is represented by Indian encounter with European civilization. You know, there is an American Indian history that is its own thing, and that's not very visible in the national park system. It really ought to be there. Um, um, along the, uh, uh, this subcommittee uh, about 20 years ago directed the National Park Service to study the theme of space exploration. And we did, and we listed a number of National Historic Landmarks based upon uh, the ex uh, trips to the moon and elsewhere, and not many of those are yet represented in the National Park System. You could probably change every one of the historic themes by, uh, improve the theme by uh, uh, giving more attention to the roles of women and minorities, um, there's been relatively little representation of the history of labor in America, and 
uh, most important perhaps, the changing definition of what it means to be American. As we has been said earlier, that's changing before our very eyes and very, very rapidly. We need to keep up with that. 20th century history would represent some of that. Wait, and, and you also uh, mentioned, Mr. Roger, the, the, the MPS, is, you talk about how MPS is exercising a leadership role in the cultural issues uh, among certified local governments and private landowners. Uh, how does that differ from the command or regulatory role that critics of the agency seem to uh, be so afraid of? Well, thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman. That's one of my favorite subjects. The, um, the, <clears throat> the whole historic preservation movement, as I said, is a grassroots movement. The energy comes from people who want something, and the various levels of government serve that energy. Um, probably 25, 30 years ago, when I was running these programs, insofar as you can run them uh, from the National Park Service perspective, you know, when I came to realize that I was responsible for this wide-ranging network of, of public and private individuals, and I had zero authority to make anyone do anything. So um, it caused me to focus on um, what leadership really is. One thing leadership is not is command, and it is not control and it's not even supervision. What leadership is, in a case like this, is shaping and maintaining a clear vision for the future. It's modeling the best in management of selected outstanding places, and it's creating environments in which others, such as our colleagues at this table, can succeed in doing the things that the National Park Service needs them to do. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Pierpont, uh, just to thank you, I thought uh, your your comments, um, testimony w was uh, was excellent, and I I think the point that we need to deal with is 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 the funding point that you brought up, and that's been brought up before. That continues to be, in my mind, an urgency that we need to deal with. Uh, and uh, I also uh, want to thank uh, all the panelists today. Uh, Ms. Wright, thank you very much. I think the issue you brought up. Uh, we had talked earlier about morale issues as well, and uh, you also brought up about the complexity of the culture, about how to end up in employment. I think your suggestions of who to link with and who to coordinate with are targeted and, and, and well represented, and thank you for that. And uh, Dr. Warner, I uh, think I reminded us again about uh, the need to uh, affix uh, some permanency to the Peace Corps uh, initiative. And also, uh, I think uh, your points about diplomacy, uh, the Park Service's role in diplomacy and, and, and an international player that we need to be are, are well received, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I have no other follow-up questions. Let me turn to Ranking Member Mr. Bishop for his. I also want to thank all uh, five of you for the uh, excellent presentation, as well as your written comments, which we have, and we will continue to go through there. I appreciate your time and effort coming here. You've obviously outlived the rest of the committee, so thank you for being here. Mr. Rogers, um, don't worry about the space exploration part. If Constellation isn't refunded, there's not going to be history anyway. Um, Mr. Ortega, I do appreciate your uh, reference, obviously, to the concept of concessions, which I think was one of those areas that needs to be explored once again. For some members of my family, um, a good park is one that has a good gift shop. Uh, for others, it depends on the kinds of bathrooms that you have there. And for me, if you're not selling the Dr. Pepper, there's no reason of going there in the first place. So I want it, I want it cold, and I want it convenient, okay? But I, what you're talking about, there's legitimate points. I especially appreciate your response to uh, Chairman's questions uh, as to what does entice people to stay there. Uh, concessions are indeed one of those reasons why people go to parks or why they will return again. So thank you very much. Thank you. Before uh, adjourning the meeting, let me, uh, uh, somebody handed me a really good qu quote, a former National Park Service Director, Newton Dewey, who was uh, 
who got into trouble for trying to stop a dam that was going to go into the National Dinos uh, to a protected area. And uh, I thought it's, good. it's a good quote to, to adjourn the meeting. If, if we're going to succeed in preserving the greatness of the National Park, they must be held inviolate. They represent the last stand of primitive America. If we're going to whittle away at them, we should recognize that all such whittlings are cumulative, and that the end result will be mediocrity, and the greatness will be gone. Thank you so much, and I appreciate it. The brown pelican is Louisiana's state bird. More than 150 oil-soaked pelicans have been brought to the Fort Jackson Bird Rehabilitation Center in Venice.